Jarvis, drop my needle. Hello, this is the hardcore legend Mick Foley, and if you are interested in listening to idiots, you came to the right place. Have a nice day. Woo! That's an attention getter. He's a very strange young man. He's an idiot. What we're dealing with here is a complete lack of respect for the law. Oh, my God, he's an idiot. You know, of course, that you're out of your jurisdiction. Personally, I think you're an idiot. But that's the evidence in the car! But I was going to Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Always like to keep my audience riveted. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, friends and fiends, and welcome to Free Range Idiocy, the podcast about everything. Uh, but mostly just the stuff we like. Honestly, folks, honestly, we really didn't plan to be talking about wrestling as much as we have this year. Really, we did not plan this. It just seems like, uh, you know, it, it's just a happenstance. Damn you, Marvel! <laughs> uh, however, uh, with the departure of Rassel and Voldemort from WWE, things seem to be getting a lot more conversation-worthy these days. So we're going to take some time this episode to uh, rehash the happenings at this p- uh, past weekend's Clash at the Castle PLE, talk about the general state of the business, and, uh, I mean, let's face it, we're going to take a few unadulterated swipes at AEW along the way in this episode 167, Rehash the Clash. I am your Uncle Todd, and with me, as always, is the man who always wanted some type of driver finishing move, move named after him, but could never quite convince Taker to rename the Tombstone to the Tim. Gee, I wonder why. He has been my partner in idiocy for over two decades, which basically means he's ready for retirement or the asylum. And, uh, you know, he never takes liberties with his opponents unless they ask really nicely. I give you the man they call. I've also never missed a rope maneuver in my life. I've also never tried to attempt one either. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> I do not see you climbing your ass up to the top rope. Oh. I don't even see you making, I don't even see you going to the, to the second turn buckle like Bret Hart did for that, that, well, that beautiful I, I elbow be he used to drop. That was I, so great. I could be tempted, but uh, sure greetings and salutations, be. my friend. How are you? And doing well, you will be tempted by the time we finish this show, and you have a I couple will. bourbons in you. Then you'd be oh. like, you know what? I can, I can do it. I can fly. I can. I can drop an elbow with the best of them. Your wife should be like, get down off the kitchen table and put your pants back on. I'd <laughs> be like, old school. <laughs> it's such a good thing that you don't have any pets. Oh my! <laughs> be landing God. on the cat. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it'd be like, oh God, here he goes again. Quick, duck for good again. Find cover. Find cover. He's why going you, aerial. <laughs> why did you insist on naming the cat Red Rooster? Because <laughs> he's going to be doing the job every time. <laughs> Anyways, uh, oh yes, uh, I'm, I'm doing fine. In case you asked, I completely lost the plot of where we were going. Uh, how are you doing, sir? You doing all right? I'm well. Uh, a belated happy Father's Day to you, sir. And uh, as well to you. Thank you. I believe we were both uh, off uh, indulging ourselves in the meats on uh, Father's Day. Yes. And, uh, yes. I, I went back to, uh, you know, two, three weeks after the fact, went back to uh, our, our favorite barbecue place, Green Street Meats. I brought my family there. They've never been. And You uh, never brought your family there? <laughs> No, because I once again, the man they call Tim (laughs) traveling first class, the rest of his family, steerage. No, come on now. They said they want, I want to go get barbecue, dad. Here's a McRib. (laughs) I I learned about this place through my coworkers and would typically go there with coworkers. So, Mm -hmm. oh, typically go. So it's multiple times you've been there. Sometimes. Yeah. Do you mean to tell me I got to go to this place before your family did? Yes. Shame. <laughs> Shame, sir. But I will say, I got the brick, uh, and it is a brick of cornbread, and mm. it was, and I slathered that bad oh. boy up with the butter, and oh my God, was that a more along the sli- si- brick more on the heaven. size of a, a uh, like a cinder block? Oh, God. well, it went down <laughs> like one too. Good <laughs> lord, holy! That'll sop something up. Oh, it will. And let me tell you. I made the mistake of ordering a double need of the Blanton, and dude, do you remember how they poured the single? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the double is about a quadruple, So <laughs> I and I'm pretty sure the cornbread soaked a lot of that up because I actually wasn't feeling a lot of it, so I'm like, all right, all right, a little snug. 
but it was good. Oh my gosh, I was I had some serious barbecue envy because the place that we went to, it what I had was good. Uh, my wife mm. said, "Aren't you gonna have? Aren't you gonna get the brisket?" I'm like, "No," because it's not gonna live up to it. And she got brisket, and then I took a bite of it, and I'm like, "That's trash compared to Green Street." <laughs> <laughs> I rarely say Chicago. that about that. It's just not. It's not even. Not even. It's not only is it not same the ballpark. It's not even the same sport. Yeah, like we are just not even close. Yeah, yeah. So it was. It was very different. However, I mean, the, I, I had some uh, some smoked pulled chicken, which was good. Mm, nice. And uh, some house made sausage, Ooh. which was also good. Nice. Um, but yeah, I wasn't going for the brisket. I'm like, I'm just that's setting myself up for disappointment. Yeah, that's all that is. I I actually went back to the pork belly too. I, I had to get the oh, pork belly. Oh, yeah. and the pork belly, it, like it wasn't the the same preparation that I, that we had when when uh, or that I had when we were there. Um, I mean, it was still you know had a nice crust on it and everything. But I mean, oh my gosh, like ladies and gentlemen, when you go to Green Street Meats in Chicago, West Loop, you you don't need the knife. You just use the edge no. of the fork, and this stuff just falls right off of it. And I and mean, they're like it is, plastic forks too. If I'm oh. right. I mean, it's that tender. Like there is no breaking of a time yeah. whatsoever. Nope. Like nope. Oh, it's just amazing, amazing food. So had a good meal, uh, good time with the family. Got to relax. Uh, had a really kind of low key weekend. So it was good. It was it was a very good weekend and uh, nice. And uh, enjoying a day off tomorrow. So uh, yeah. Living the best life, my friend. I'm gonna go see some trombone shorty tomorrow. Well, I well in other trombone related news, I finished oh. off uh, Father's Day by going to see Funky Fred Wesley, who I mean, nice. one of the godfathers of funk music. He was there for for all of it. You know, former James Brown band leader. Wow. You know, band leader of the of the JBs, which was this is how popular James Brown was. Kids, his backing band went out and cut albums without James, and they sold a butt ton of albums. <laughs> Jeez. Um, and then he was touring with Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton, uh, doing his own thing, toured with Maceo Parker, has been touring on his own, you know, mm-hmm. and, and just one of those guys who has been around forever. And it was such a pleasure to actually one of those guys. I was like, I'm never going to get a chance to see him because he's not mm-hmm. going to come this far north. Like he might be in Boston, but there's no way he's going to come any further north than that. And lo and behold, he was in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And it was great. It was absolutely great. So much fun. So much fun. Nice. Nice. Great cherry on top of the Father's Day Sunday, if you will. Very cool. Very cool. However, we've had enough of our recalling of weekends. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to get into the part of the show that the man they call Tim likes the best. Ladies and gentlemen, the Week in Geek. It's right here, Ray. It's looking at me. Listen, you smell that? It feels so funky. It does feel so funky. All right, my friends. Well, uh, we're going to kick off the Week in Geek with a little uh, personal milestone for the man they call Tim. Oh, boy. And uh, Uncle Wait, Todd. Uh, milestone or gallstone? No, this is a milestone, not a okay. gallstone. I, I'd be very clear if it was a gallstone. I'd be like, ah! But, you know, it is not a gallstone, my friend. It is. And he'd be holding up this little jar like, would you look at this thing? Like, oh, God. <laughs> This was inside of me at one point. <laughs> but no, we uh, we have hit two hundo, two bills uh, of miles traveled on the electric scooter as oh. of this evening. Rolled into the uh, fine uh, palatial estate and... Uh, yeah, when I went to power it off, there, were, there it was two hundred point five miles traveled on the electric scooter. Did you take uh, a picture to to? Make I did sure not you take moralize a that moment. I did not take a picture. I can Come do on. it. Picks or it didn't happen. All right, all right, but uh, but yeah, you know, it's uh, I've had the uh, scooter for about a year and a half, and uh, yeah, it's been it uh, seems like a lot longer. It heck seems of a ride. Like and uh, you know, have, have not shamed myself in the process. If anything. <laughs> I, uh, I I look like a man about the town as I scoot past everyone as they're slogging their way in ninety degree heat walking to the train station while I per, you know peruse and caruse by. You uh, are worse than Hulk Hogan. Wind flowing through. Well, I don't have any hair, but you know what I mean. Oh my! <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Good He's God. back. <laughs> 
I got to play that because every time God I do bless that, you, Sulu. George Takei gets gets like a, a cent and a half or something. So I got to make sure I keep su- yeah. Sulu in you know mortgage payments. Can uh, can I get a little glorious for this uh, milestone, sir? No, if, if, if I may. No. no. Okay. Well, I I would appreciate it at some point during this episode to get a little glorious. But nonetheless, you would, huh? Shut up, Wesley. All right. Uh, moving right along from a uh, uh, man they call Tim's uh, two bill milestone riding the scooter. We move to a more, uh, well, a, a, a less so uh, milestone that one would want to brag about. Uh, we, we talked about, or Uncle Todd did mention at the top here, talking a little about uh, AEW. And um, according to our good friends at CagesideSeats.com, purveyors of uh, all accurate and very timely news in the wrestling industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Windy City. I, I, I love the sub byline of this. Uh, I'll, I'll read the, the actual title, but the sub byline is great. The Windy City is blowing off AEW as Chicago fans flock to WWE instead. Ouch! Boom! <laughs> to quote the great John Stewart. Uh, the, the actual title of this article is AEW faces record low attendance in Chicago for the July 3rd Dynamite. Uh, by the way, uh, WWE will be in Chicago for this Friday SmackDown. A Probably will be weeks. a sold out affair. A good two weeks in between, and they're yep. still basically saying they're going to WWE instead of AEW, which is a little misleading, but it's also kind of true. <laughs> yes. As of June fourteenth, so about yes. four days ago, folks, only uh, and and let me make sure I have this right. Uh, they're going to be at the Wintrust Arena, which. Let's see. It's same venue. I just want to make sure I have those numbers right. So that's uh, not the the Wind Trust. Oh, sorry. That's not the same arena that WWE runs, right? No, no. It, it's not the United Center. It's it's okay. a smaller arena, like DePaul, where my oldest son goes to. He they their basketball teams usually play there. Okay. Um, and they do have they they have been there before. They've been to both Wind Trust Arena and to United Center. But Wind Trust should uh, hold about ten thousand people. Okay. As of June fourteenth, AEW has sold two thousand seven hundred and eighty-eight tickets. Well, I mean, <sighs> on the bright side, they would have sold out the Whittemore Center in Durham, New Hampshire. Holy moly! Uh, eh? and, well, and here's the thing: these tickets have been distributed for the upcoming Dynamite and Rampage event, so they're going to be recording two shows that night. Uh, in contrast, AEW's last Chicago show in November of twenty twenty-three at the same venue saw over five thousand tickets distributed. Uh, this is uh, quite painful, and then well, you. But that's look, still not even close to a sellout, and that was no. after Punk had left, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. This was after the, uh, and and we talked at length about this going back, you know, several years to when Punk debuted in AEW with with one of the most, uh, you know, just oh, yeah. loud and amazing returns you've ever seen. Um, man, was that it's, the United it's, Center. That I think that was the United. Because that was a that was a big yeah. show. That was a United Center. Jeez. So uh, it, it, the, the article also notes, um, let's see, in recent years, Chicago, yeah, so Wintrust has hosted six events, including Revolution, which was a pay-per-view, um, November episode of Dynamite, uh, that saw almost 7,100 tickets distributed. In 2022, mm. uh, they presented their Forbidden Door uh, pay-per-view at the United Center. That's where they do cross-promotion with other you know, kind of lesser known independent promotions with over 16,000 fans packing the house. So they've done some good business in Chicago. But the decline in attendance reflects a bar- broader trend uh, of, de- of decreased viewership. Um, mm-hmm. It doesn't help that they terminated Punk. I mean, Punk punk was one of the big draws. Well, know? yeah. I mean, and, and, yeah. especially for Chicago, but I mean, yeah, but in general, yeah. totally. Yeah. But the, it does note that... Um, on the day uh, Khan went public with Punk's dismissal, AEW was at Chicago's United Center for Collision. After the show, the Young Bucks, who had a violent falling out with Punk in 2022, I like that violent falling out, took a victory lap in the ring, which many interpreted as a jab at the four, eight, former AEW world champion who has since returned to WWE. I think it's safe to say when you look at the Bucks and you look at Punk, Punk just keeps getting proven right time and time and time again and they just the bucks keep looking like the jokes that they are you know what i mean that whole working with children line has oh, aged oh boy like fine wine really it's it just yeah. yeah tell me when i'm telling lies that's right that's right so uh yeah 
Barely 3,000 people are going to go see AEW, and I'm sure Friday night on SmackDown, it'll be a sold-out house at the United oh, Center. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just incredible how well, I mean, much has changed in, in two and a half, three years with that organization. Well, and you correct me if I'm wrong. And and and, and you know what, the folks, here's here's something for, for the AEW-ites out there, uh, not to be confused with uh, Amalekites or any other ites. I don't know. I, I had something that I was going to go with but then i'd all just escape me but anyways but not to you know poke at the aew well actually to hell with it there's only like 10 of them um aew fans the fact is like this is the guy who's running that show this is his his doing in a lot of ways like he's the one who keeps on trying to talk like he's in competition with wwe when there is no competition this is not a rivalry ladies and gentlemen this is not a rivalry this is if, if it's a rivalry it is like the late 90s Red Sox versus the Yankees. Yep. Like actually mid 90s mm-hmm. to late 90s Red Sox versus Yankees. There's no rivalry cuz one team is is getting its keister kicked 80% of the time. Yep. And in AEW's case, it's 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. Like they are over. Yep. Like they can't even outdraw they well they barely I think outdraw wwe's c show their developmental Mm -hmm. show with their a show and then all it takes is like one star showing up (laughs) and all of a sudden now the c show is beating the a show it's like if it's like the freaking you know toledo mud hens bragging about their attendance and how they're in competition with like i don't know the dodgers or something like really really it's in it's insane it is it is and and, and the fact is like there these these attendance numbers aren't because they are so watered down like AEW doesn't have house shows right they don't they no. don't tour it's no. only their televised tapings in the meantime WWE i believe now might be doing two teams like i think they have two house sh- two tours going at the same time yeah yeah their and their house show business is going really well yeah they're making money hand over fist. They've got cities bidding on their PLEs like it's a Super Bowl. Yeah. They're they're building great stories. They're building stronger characters. I mean, you know, you look at Cody Rhodes, and, and I always think about this now when I see him come out as, as the world champion, that, you know, he for a long time, and, and he, I think, admits that he made some missteps when he was in AEW with the way he kind of handled things. He, he had lost a match where – um, to, to MJF where he could never challenge for the world heavyweight or no, uh, sorry, he, he lost to Jericho, I think when Jericho was champion and, and if he didn't beat him, he would never challenge again for the title or something like that. And he stuck with that. He, that, that was kind of a, a running thing. He just would never challenge for the world championship because he, he just wanted to make a name for himself in a different way. And, and it just didn't go well. And, and, you know, toward the end of his run in AEW for all the you know, he, he did, he had, he had some amazing matches. He had an amazing match with Andrada where, I mean, you know, there was a flaming table involved, which, you know, was great. Like, that's the thing. It's like AEW is doing all this crazy stuff and it's not moving the needle for the fans. You know I mean? It's, it's, it's crazy to see it, you know, maybe pops folks in the moment, but it doesn't draw more people to see the product and to see Cody now as this polished, you know, working man's world champion who has garnered a lot of respect, who, you know, is, is the champion who's, you know, bringing the, the, the little kids who dress like him into the aisle. And, and, you know, when he's at the house shows and doing the Cody pose during his entrance and stuff like that. I mean, no one toward his, toward the end of AEW, no one cared about him. Yeah. Like, like Arn Anderson gave that, that, I mean, Arn Anderson cut a promo that put Arn Anderson over more than Cody Rhodes about, you know, how he's not a killer. And it, it just, it was just like he was sunk, you know? And so Mm -hmm. it's, they just have a real problem developing talent and, and, and not only that, but, but telling, you know, compelling stories and they think they're doing, you know, this great thing, you know, the bucks being the court, you know, they're leaning into the whole corporate VP thing now and being the evil VPs and stuff. And it's just like, but no one cares about the bucks. I mean, the bucks are not at the same level as a punk or as a Reigns or as a Rhodes or, or, you know, a Rollins. Wow. There's a lot of R's in there. Um, but, uh, but uh, seriously, them. Rollins, Rollins. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, I, I'm always amazed by 
for as much freedom as they had, um, it almost feels like they've gotten too big or, 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 or they've expanded too much in, in so many directions that they can't rein it all in. You know, they have so many championships now with apparently Khan wants to introduce more title belts, which it's like at that point, like everyone has a belt who cares, you know? So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I, I used to be, I used to really be into them in like 2020, 2021, 2022 when punk was in it. Um, but ever since he's left, I've, I just don't watch the show anymore. I just don't have interest in it. I, I like some of the talent that's there. Unfortunately, I don't know that they're plugged into really good programs. I mean, Samoa Joe is a strong world champion. MJF is a great talent. Um, their current champion, Swerve Strickland, he used to be an NXT guy who mm-hmm. just couldn't, you know, hit his stride in WWE and he's now their world champion and he's had some amazing matches, but they just don't know how to promote people. You know what I mean? It's th- well, that to me is the problem. Yeah, I mean, Bischoff had it right on his on eighty three weeks. Like he talks about, like he Tony is is trying to push, like, hey, this is the way it is. This is the way it is. This is the way it is, and the majority of the audience is saying, no, we don't want it. And he's sitting mm-hmm. there trying to tell him, no, no, this is what you want. This is what I know what you want. You want this, yeah. and they're like, no, we actually don't. Like, yeah, yeah, some of these matches are cool, but the majority of fans and 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 again like the 10 AEW fans out there can can piss and moan about it all they want the majority of fans are showing they are interested in the characters and yeah. the matches yes i i think that the matches at least have to be good mm-hmm. i don't think that some of the stuff that used to go on is is i think the matches the actual match quality has improved but you notice what improved first the character work mm-hmm the 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 booking the the booking in terms of character and storyline improved first Mm -hmm. and then the work rate kind of followed and to me it's like that is the way that it's that's the way it's working these days and maybe Mm -hmm. hey 20 30 years ago it didn't work like that i don't know i'm not i've never been in the business but it seems to me like if one if one company is making billions of dollars hand over fist like literally is getting a billion dollars from netflix for their a show mm-hmm. i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna say like gee there's something to this folks <laughs> there's yeah. something to it as much as tony wants to tell you it's all wrong and and i'm right i i beg to differ and uh, apparently a few million fans beg to differ as well yeah yeah <sighs> I do there. feel bad for folks like, you know, Adam Copeland and, and like I mentioned, Swerve Strickland and some of these other guys who um, are, are they're trying to do great work. And it's just but but because of the shrinking fan base, it's just not, you know, it you know, like it doesn't make me happy to see like pictures of Copeland walking out and half the arena is empty. Like I, I know no. he probably had grander visions for what he was trying to do. I think he and from everything I've read, like he's really stepped into being that sort of mentor and you know kind of elder statesman in the locker room to really work with the young guys and stuff which is great you know and so it's just you know too bad that it's just not kind of leading to the sort of groundswell of fan support that something like punk's return really you know gave, you know boosted them quite a bit you well, know it's nice so. that he's working with them and there's this you know you've got plenty of guys there who could mentor yeah you've got christian you've got edge you've got Samoa joe you've got Jericho, if he if his head was fully removed from his from his buttocks, mm-hmm. um, I'm sure I'm missing a couple others. I mean, hell, even Kenny Omega, he's been around for quite a while, ain't he? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like any number of these guys can mentor all the live long day. It doesn't matter though if you are if your if your storylines, if your character work, and that comes from is a byproduct of how you book people. Mm. If that is just crap and all you're, all you're concerned with is, Oh wow, we're going to have a great match. We're gonna have a great tournament and this and that and the other. It's like, that's all well and good. But if your character work sucks, Mm -hmm. who really cares? Yeah. You know, it goes back to Paul Heyman when he's like, who are these guys? Why are they fighting? And why should I buy a ticket? Yep. The first part of that is who are these guys? Yeah. You know, like that, that is important. Who they, Mm -hmm. who the characters are is important. Yep. You know, anyways. 100%. All right. Well, I think we've beaten AEW into the ground enough. Uh, All 2,700 fans along for the ride. I wonder how many tickets are going to get given away for that. (sighs) At least they can even give them away. I don't know. 
I don't know. I I wouldn't even go. I just picture like Tony and like some of the like the the C level star like people out on the streets like trying to give away tickets and people are turning around like you know like cell phone brochures like get out of here. You know, it used to be when like John Cena would throw his hat out to the crowd and then the crowd would throw it back in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> like we don't want it. Or what is it? What do the Cubs oh. do at Wrigley? The Cubs fans they throw the home run ball back. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. If it's the opposing team. Right. Uh, well, our next story from ScreenRant.com, purveyors of all that is uh, good and wonderful in the world of sci-fi. Uh, Uncle Todd might be interested in this one. I think I think we've alluded to this movie in the past, possibly. Do you remember the movie from 1985, Enemy Mine? Yes. With Dennis Quaid and Lou, Louis Gossett Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, it looks like uh, this movie might be getting a remake, a 21st century remake with none other than Terry Matsalis, uh, fresh off of Picard Season 3, uh, leading it up. Uh, 20th Century Studios, yep, he's writing the screenplay, and uh, uh, he will uh, you know, be, be putting that together. For those who had seen that movie, it was, uh, it was considered a commercial and critical failure, but yet it was a cult hit. It was a, a movie that was kind of a raw sci-fi movie about uh, you know, two blood, uh, blood-sworn enemies uh, stranded on a planet and learning about one another and, and kind of forging a, a bond uh, through, through their time um, just surviving on this planet, just the two of them. And so it was a, um, I had seen it a long time ago. Um, and, and I remember it was, it was just, it was one of those movies that, you, you know, you, you were kind of like, Oh God, this looks like crap. And then you're watching it and it's, and it just like sucks you in. It's a good, it's a good story. It does have some um, good performances. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, it looks like this will be, uh, coming back and, uh, we will, and, and, you know, already they're jumping into the whole thing of, um, you know, the, the, the movie enemy mine is based off of a 1979 novella of the same name by Barry B. Longyear. Uh, he eventually wrote two sequels in what was later called the Enemy Papers trilogy. Oh, so there is a uh, potential franchise here in the making, sir, of Enemy Mine. Uh, what are your thoughts? And uh, do wake up if you have fallen asleep. I'm just contemplating getting the bourbon bottle over here to have to deal with yet another remake. And, oh, it's going to be a franchise. Like, how about you make one good movie first? Let's make one good movie. Not even Fair great. Enough. Just good. Fair enough. I mean, I guess fine. It's not like it's a treasured, you know, memory of mine, but it's it's a little frustrating to see just like out and out remake. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's. I'm just not that interested in that. Right now, for whatever you know, for whatever reason, because I just find it boring. I saw the original. Like, meh. Did you like it? Actually, I did. Like, I don't. I don't think I. I definitely didn't see it in the theater, but I remember catching it on like. Um, you know, like HBO or something like that when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember, I remember like, even as a kid, like, wow, this is kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. not, this is not kind of Star Wars, you know, zip, zap, zip and all that stuff. It's like, this is kind of a little deeper. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what, you know, something I kind of miss with movies and, and how they are now is that, you know, you, you don't have these sort of, I wouldn't call this a low budget, but I mean, it was not a blockbuster. You know what I mean? It was, it was on a smaller budget than like you mentioned, Star Wars or Star Trek. And yet it had a great story to it. And I I always remember like in the eighties and going to the nineties, there were always movies that, you know, they, they weren't the blockbuster, but they were kind of like right in the middle. And and some of them had really good stories to them, you know, and they were like surprises, you know, you didn't expect a lot of them and they're like, wow, that was really good. It stuck with you. You know? Yeah. This was one of those movies for me. So. I've seen a lot of folks who are who are much more savvy about movies than I am, and, and kind of the economics of Hollywood, kind of decrying the fact that there are no more of those mid middle budget movies anymore. Yeah. like it's either yeah. blockbuster now or it's kind of in very much an indie sort of thing, like that mm. middle ground of like being able to have a reasonably budgeted movie that could still kind of look bigger than its budget, mm-hmm. but was like, but I think a lot of that has to do with there's just you know, there's not as many studios out there. Like you don't have like the Canon studios and mm-hmm. you know some of the other studios that were, that were like living off of those. And, 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 you know, now it's like the, the content providers like Amazon, Netflix, they're, they're producing their own stuff, 
Yeah. And that feels like that's kind of like where that middle ground budget would have been. Yeah. Back in the day, you know. Yeah. Back in my day. Yeah, back in 85, the movie only earned 12.3 million despite costing 40. Ooh. So that's how much of a uh yeah, that's going to leave a mark. Yeah, cuz usually the rule of thumb is your budget is also then your advertising budget. So mm-hmm. you're looking at 80 million. Yeah. Getting that out the door and getting the word out in the street. Word on the street. And All right, well we will that is rough. We will wait with bated breath for a potential Enemy Mine remake. Uh, you're, you're granting them a lot of baiting there. That's not, there's no baiting of my breath. Well, uh, last story uh, before we get into a, a quick victory lap here mm. uh, is from our friends at InsideTheMagic.net, uh, basically purveyors of the 75% boilerplate repeat content <laughs> and 25% of actual story. Uh, All I'll, of I'll the summarize. AI stories. <laughs> yes, the AI stories. I'll summarize it for you right here, folks. Uh, the next Star Wars movie that will uh, feature uh, Daisy Ridley reprising her character of Rey oh, Skywalker uh, uh-huh. will be in a new movie called, allegedly, Star Wars Episode Ten: A New Beginning. Oh, crap. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Some thought it was going to be called New Jedi Order, but uh, instead it is going to be called A New beginning uh filming is scheduled to begin later this year with pre-production activities already underway production will span multiple locations worldwide utilizing utilizing a mix of real world settings and advanced studio environments to bring the galaxy far far away to life i must say it's better than the phantom menace or no i'm sorry i liked phantom menace attack of the clones that's what i meant i I was not a big fan of attack of the clones (sighs) I, I felt too much what, like release the clowns, you know, or I feel like clowns. attack of the clones, a new beginning. It, they're, they're really neck and neck on their way to like the turd pile mm-hmm. as far as titles go. Like I'm excited for the movie, like just cause it's star Wars. And, and I, I think Daisy Ridley did a, did a pretty damn good job in those flicks. Yeah, she did. Um, she represented this, well. Yeah. In spite of like the unevenness and kind of the absolute jankiness of the third movie, but, Damn, a new beginning? Like, uh. Hey, it's going to be a non-Skywalker-focused story. It's a new beginning for all of us. I've been watching a lot of um, the old Dusty Rhodes uh, American Dream Americana uh, sketches on uh, Instagram, and I love his smile at the end of all of them. He's like... <laughs> Especially the one where he's like working in the butcher shop and like... Yeah has no shirt on i'm like this is the least hygienic butcher shop in the world like please at least tell me he's wearing jeans like is he wearing his wrestling tonk trunks I, under there so again when i watch this at first excuse me i think a polka dot fell off it might have fallen into your liverwurst <laughs> i didn't pick this up when i was a kid but now that i'm older the way he ends it is just so wrong he's like you can't beat my prices and you can <laughs> beat my meat yep Yep. And then he does that. <laughs> and then they kept doing the stupid gimmick at the end of those things where they were always hey, like, Hey, aren't oh, you? Aren't you? <laughs> America. Which, uh, oh, sing it, brother. Dream. If and then will. it takes forever to get the kunk, kunk, like the, the freaking cowbell coming in i'm like you just a we, common man could we have just like kicked right into that bad boy right after that we, like, we don't on the soundboard dude oh dude i love love that song it's come on it's that in the blue blazer theme if i had to pick oh. my top three like like just kitschy yes like just like amusing only to me mm-hmm. the american dream dusty roads wwe polka dot theme yep the blue blazer you know pour one out for owen hart uh, that I mean, because it was kind of funky yeah. as hell. Oh yeah, yeah. And then Godfather, of course. Oh, of course. Just because I mean, back in the attitude days, you hear that. Bow, 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 oh. bow, bow, bow. I mean, would, I mean n- nuts. Would you not agree that next to the glass shattering for Stone Cold, was there a sound that started um, that got everyone off their feet more than that? I mean, honestly, it's 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 Austin one. Rock two, but yeah. a, a yeah. fairly distant two, yeah. Because the 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 breaking glass was just like there was this like 
reflexive thing that was just like it seemed like it burned into people's DNA. I mean, to, literally, like, it would go off, and you oh, would yeah. just visually see everyone stand up and just go nuts. I mean, yeah. it was like that. It was incredible. But I mean, honestly, yeah, like Godfather, probably third. Yes. I when mean, that, and, when that, bow, bow, I mean, everyone got up and they started and, screaming. <laughs> and you, I mean, and that's back when you have like DX. Yeah. You've yeah. got you had some you had some people who who would get a pop. Yep. But Godfather, I don't know, like it was. It's just like maybe the people were just like Charles hey. Wright, the unsung hero of the Attitude Era. Well, and and his ladies <sighs> from the local gentlemen's clubs. Well, bringing it back to Star Wars here, we we <laughs> we we've went off on one of our tangents. Can we get Charles Wright we... into this into this. Can we can he be like a, a Jedi that somehow escaped Order sixty six? Now I can either I can either whip your ass with this lightsaber, <laughs> or, or I can whip your ass with the force. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, we will have to see if Episode Ten, a new beginning, is uh, is in fact what we will get as a final title God. for this upcoming release. I hope this is a trial balloon and it gets shot down in glorious fury. Uh, lastly. Yes. And, and and if I could please request some sort of, whether it be punk, whether it be glorious, but some music to acknowledge the real world champions of the National Basketball Association. The Boston Celtics, ladies and gentlemen, 2024 Boston Celtics. They did not give in until they were victorious. And they will defend next year. You best be ready. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Last night, was it 106 to 88? They whooped the Mavericks and whooped them good at home. Oh, 16 years to the day after the last one. Let's get that fireworks going, baby. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that game. Oh, gosh. So here's the thing. Uh, I, Tatum I, Brown, the whole gang, ba bam! I did not get a chance to watch any of the first three games, which apparently you know, which they handled Dallas fairly well, three to zero. Yeah, I make time to watch game four, and I watched like the entire first half, yeah. and oh my gosh! First of all, they they played like dog poo. Don't don't make it make any mistake. Mm-hmm. However, it also appeared that the fix was in because there, <laughs> there, there was like, yeah. okay, that's not a foul. Um, uh, all righty. Um, but then, so I would, I was watching, bet- I was flipping between Raw and Game 5. Mm-hmm. And I kid you not, man, every time I switch to the game, like they're up by like 24 or 25. Mm-hmm. Then Dallas goes on a little mini run as I'm watching. I'm like, okay, back to Raw. I'm the bad luck guy. Yep. I am the bad luck yep. guy, you know. Yep. And so I, I did manage to, to flip over just in time to see the end of the second quarter mm-hmm. uh, with Pritchett <laughs> hoisting up that like almost three quarter court shot. Nothing but net. Oh, my gosh. That was incredible. That and then was Tatum incredible. almost like just like takes him out like with almost like a, a flying cross body because <laughs> Pritchett is, a, is not a tall dude. And Tatum was jumping. So he almost oh. got like he I mean, he almost got like the junk to the face it was yeah. like okay that's yeah. not that ain't cool that's not what he was looking for no but um but that was cool the only thing i have to complain about is the uh the cable provider here in in maine cut off like the celebration and everything else oh my gosh like i just i because i flip back from uh raw and it's just over and wow on to the 11 o'clock news i'm like uh trophy so we have sling TV, anything and i don't know if we were getting name national was it nbc i don't know where we were watching but mm. or if it was tnt i forget but um whatever channel we were watching i mean they they carried yeah everything afterwards for a bit um maybe here, here's the scene for me know. last night though so i'm you know I, I was doing a little work while i had ron and then i realized as i was wrapping stuff up uh i realized the celtics game is on and it's like you know second quarter so i go upstairs and um we have Sling TV, so we, we Chromecast that to our television set. So so my wife did that. In the meantime, I'm running Sling TV with Raw on my phone. So I'm watching you the game. Man, you. I'm watching the game, and I'm keeping an eye on Raw. 
So when the game is about to end, and we'll get to this later, how how they end Raw last night, Mm -hmm. it was literally a fight. It was split attention. It's like, they're winning. What the hell's happening? They're winning. Is that Chad Gable bloodied and murdered? I was like, what the hell's going on? (laughs) Which child do I drop? (laughs) It was funny. but And then for game four, um, my my wife and I were at our uh, favorite restaurant, Adele's. And uh, I, I convinced our good friend uh, Herman, the bartender, to allow me to commandeer the televisions in the bar to have game four on. To wit, once we saw that it was not going well, uh, at some point, either someone else commandeered the TVs or they just auto switched over to the White Sox game that was airing. Because yeah. I forget sometimes that I live in Chicago and people don't really give a rip about Boston. So, yeah. uh, but that game... It, it, it was fine to not watch much more because I was getting upset. Uncle Todd well, was like, texting me. You were like five bourbons in on that night. I could tell by the <laughs> typing because you're, oh. you're getting edgy. And I'm like, dude, you're better off watching the White Sox right now than yeah. this. I'm, I'm turning off. I'm going to bed. I was I was not pleased. But, yeah, I, I was feeling good about life when we were uh, wrapping up there. We we were there till like 10 o'clock, dude. We, we got there at 6, and we were there for like four <laughs> hours. Our guitar friend was playing, and then he came over to our table when he was done his set. At nine o'clock, he came over and he chatted with us for a. We talked for about an hour. It was great. We had a good, good Once conversation. Again, and they all think they're paying tribute to some <laughs> Chicago and mobster. Come on now, come and they're on. all going to be sorely disappointed when they uh, when the real fat Tony makes his appearance. <laughs> you gave we thought Frum, it was you. We thought it was you. Gabe from the Sausage King of Chicago shows oh, up. Good lord, good lord. Well. Once again, a, uh, a a ode of congratulations to the Boston Celtics team, a team effort, yeah. and uh, they they uh, they ended it on a high note. They 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 whooped them. They whooped them well, and uh, all is well in 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 Bean Town with the NBA championship coming back home for the eighteenth time. Woo! Oh my. Yeah, I'll let that slide. <laughs> <laughs> that is full on appropriate, Sulu. <laughs> You get on with your bad self. <laughs> Make him humble. All right. Well, that, my friends, is a celebratory and somewhat, uh, well, yeah, celebratory week in geek. I was going to say something else, but I decided not to. So oh, I'll just leave well, it good on that. you. All um, right. So we are going to talk a little bit here about Clash at the Castle because uh, this, again, we didn't, we, hadn't, we didn't do a preview of this. We, we kind of had this penciled in as maybe something to talk about. And, uh, and then watching this well you actually watched it first because do you watch it live or do you watch a little bit of the delay on saturday so i originally wasn't planning to watch the whole event i was just going to watch the two world title matches that's kind of what we agreed to do and then i sat down and um i realized i i I use uh quicken for our finances i realized i hadn't been reconciling you know kind of our checkbook in a while so i was doing that i ended up finding out it'd been like a couple months so i'm like going through things so it made like great background stuff as I'm kind of working on things to, you know, like I, I watched the Cody fight. I was kind of working on stuff while the tag matches and some of the lower card matches were on. And then I, you know, focused again when, uh, when Priest and, um, El and, and McIntyre were fighting. And so, um, so again, wasn't my intent to watch the whole thing, but I ended up doing it. And it was actually a really, I, I was, I got to say like, you know, was it a WrestleMania? No, but it was a pretty solid event overall, you know? Which has kind of been, that's been the MO. Like all yeah. of these, the, the PLEs, because before, I mean, even even WrestleMania under the Vince watch was not good. You know, it had its moments, but it was almost more in spite of, you know, who's running the show than because of. Yeah. And now, I mean, I think it's taken people a little while to get used to the idea of only five matches on these PLEs. Yeah. And that's, yeah. kind, I mean, we're kind of seeing like that's what it consistently is. Mm-hmm. And even I was like, OK, this is going to get old after a while. But it makes so much sense when you think about the idea that you're letting these matches stretch longer. You're letting them go. Letting longer. them breathe. Yeah. Um, I do have a f- little bit of a feedback on that, though. Like we've got to stop with the face off in the middle of the ring and both guys looking each way. Like, it seems like it's mm-hmm. happening way too often where they're like, they're just soaking in the moment. I'm like, okay, that's great every so often. Mm-hmm. But even if like every main event, it's too much. Like, yeah, I, that's why I kind of appreciated, uh, what was it? Was it AJ Styles and LA Knight at one of the PLEs? Just like, there was like nothing. It was just like went right into each other. Yeah. <laughs> like, that. thank you. At least something different. 
you know it's yeah styles right. and Rhodes started teeing off on each other it was it was yeah uh, it was, i'm sorry we're getting into the match but yeah but uh but the but the i think it, they've been proven right like these kind of work really well to and and having some different match styles because the only having five matches like you're not getting into this thing where it's like oh it's another dq finish oh it's another this it's another that like you're having multiple similar finishes because you've got like eight nine ten matches mm-hmm. you know and, and half of them are glorified squash matches well there's only but so many ways especially if you're kind of old school and you're like well this is the way it's got to go pal um you you're limited mm-hmm. and in, in this like for five matches okay we can figure out some interesting ways for this stuff to go and you can yeah. like you said that's the best way to put it let it letting the matches breathe mm-hmm. in and of themselves you have space yep. so you don't have these matches where everyone's like oh i gotta get my stuff in you know it's been working and it's been churning out like consistently good ple's that are like okay and the crowds i mean don't yeah. don't get me wrong like the backlash the, especially the european crowds the international crowds so far are killing it Mm-hmm. The Aussie crowd, the 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 uh, the backlash France crowd, oh, the France Scotland, crowd. Holy they're God. all delivering, dude. Like yep. the the soccer chants going on, mm-hmm. the, the like Drew McIntyre. Like I, I'm like all yeah. of that stuff is just awesome. Yep. Um, and it 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 gets to this point where like watching a lot of the old um, uh, wrestling with regret, uh, Brian Zane uh, pe- uh, pay per view reviews where he'll be like this is basically like a raw match you know mm-hmm. this could have been of this and that like these matches and these events seem special because the matches extend more they breathe more they're not yeah. doing as much of like the promo storytelling during a ple it really kind of gets down to like here's the match here's the payoff yeah or here's something that's going to lead to the next thing yep and that's awesome I think that's I think that's a really great change, and obviously I think it's working with people because I don't think we're the only ones who appreciate the uh, I hate saying it, but the Paul Levesque era um, PLE. I know, um, but yeah, no, I, it's it, this has been kind of a nice change, and it's been the same sort of thing. Like I didn't plan on watching the whole sh- like I didn't plan on watching all of Backlash. Yep. But damn, if I didn't get sucked right in, and the same with this one, where I was like, "Okay, mm-hmm. I'm probably going to watch this whole damn thing." Right yep. on. Yeah. No, it was great. Great event. Great yeah. event. And I mean, the way they started out, I mean, good God, like right out of the shoot, like we've got Cody and AJ. Yeah. Like, damn. Okay, I didn't see that coming. Nope. I was like, I figured this would be sub main event or or main event, but then of course, like uh, McIntyre is going to main event it. Like, kind of made that obvious. Yeah. But damn, like coming right out of the shoot with this one and a hell of a match. Yeah. I was I was surprised and and pleasantly surprised. What do you think about this match? Because I yeah. think you you were kind of you texted me when you were watching it uh, and you gave some was, kind of non spoiler thoughts. It was pretty I, I, I liked how they were trying to give it a raw, brutal feel. I mean, like mm. there was a point within the first couple of minutes, Cody's punching AJ and 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 you know, credit to him, you know selling the psychology that way just just laying in some shots on him and he's like shaking his hand like damn that that punch hurt <laughs> you know yes. what i mean like like i thought that was a great effect like they both were just bringing the like like they did such a great job in the in in the preceding smackdowns to build to this you know Rhodes who is just wanting to just tear into styles and yeah Styles, who is hungry for that shot because he knows he doesn't have much time left with his career, and just the two of them just clashing right away and just beating the hell out of each other. I mean, it's it started off great with Rhodes dominating, and then Styles dominated a lot of the match. Mm. Just you know, real brutality on on Rhodes. I mean, s- some of that stuff was just oh my gosh. It's like yeah, there's there's no fake in some of that stuff, folks. I mean that that was just laying no. it in thick. Um, and uh, but but then with with the great you know kind of turnaround toward the end, I love that spot where he goes to do the the phenomenal forearm, and uh, and and Rose just throws the chair at him, you know, clocks him, and then he goes <laughs> falling through the table. Like I yes. mean, it was just like the best like mousetrap version of you know like 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 just turning the the tide of the match, and then of course you know getting the handcuffs involved and uh, and. And it was interesting to me the way they did the I quit because I didn't know if it was going to be 
you know, through Cody doing, you know, some, some really vicious brutality, you know, like, like if you go all the way back to the mid eighties with Magnum TA and Tully Blanchard and, you know, that one ended pretty violent. Like, you know, TA was basically taking like a blunt object and jabbing it into his eye, you know, well, that's he like finally... old school Southern wrestling. I mean, oh yeah. Was like the blood's yeah. going to flow. You know? And this yeah. one, Cody was getting brutal and, you know, Styles is like, okay, I'm either going to take the stairs to the head and I can't move or I got to quit. And he quit, you know, Which, and, and he, I thought that was such a great way to end it. Yes. Like, because it, it, it he didn't have to knock him out. You know what I mean? It was just the threat of bodily harm that was going to happen to him. Well, but it shows like, oh, like logic can enter into this. Yes. Like I, there's no way I'm getting out of this and I'm going to take that, that set of stairs to my face. Mm hmm. Maybe it's better to to quit and fight another day, <laughs> you know. Like it, it's like, oh, reality can kind of enter into this a little bit, you yeah. know. Yeah. No, that was that was such a great and and I think I texted you like, I think we might be seeing a, a few seeds sown for the Cody uh, future heel turn. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, it's going to be great. He he is going to be such a great heel. Oh yeah. Especially if they do it while he's champ. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Yep. Oh. And hey, what be- about Mama Rhodes? Like she, she laid in a few slaps. She wasn't taking any malarkey from from AJ. Oh, I, I was love wondering. The fact that like I think it was that was supposed to be like one or two, and she like laid in two or three quick. Like oh, boom, yeah. boom. well, it it was funny. She like paused for a second. And you're like, yeah. It's like okay, she she's almost like, do I really want to do? You know, should I really yeah. do this? And then it was just like one round. It was like whack, 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 whack. <laughs> well, just, I, <laughs> well, I wonder if it was almost like AJ be like, no, no, come on. Like lay it in. Yeah. Like (laughs) Like, this is money right here. You want, you want your baby boy to make some cash out of this, right? (laughs) There was a part of me that was afraid given the attention. And this would have been a total Vince maneuver Mm. given the attention they were showing her. If they were going to work some stupid angle where Cody were to say, I quit because AJ was threatening his mother. Like yeah. that's where I thought they were going to go for a little bit. And I was very grateful they didn't. They kept it to just the two of them. Yeah. It was just mano y mano. She was there on the side cheering him on and slapping yeah. AJ around from mouth and off to her. Mm-hmm. I mean, and she brought the salty language too. Like oh, there was yeah. no she, doubt what she was saying at one point. She called him an a-hole. Like I mean, it was so caught in the oh, line. I thought she mic. said, said MF or two. I thought, I thought oh, I saw, she might have. Uh, yeah, I thought she worked that in as well. And I so. love the fact that like after she did that, like, Mama Rhodes got a huge ass pop. <laughs> like the, the Scottish crowd was like, she's one of us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Freedom. Um, him again. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I really, I just thought the rawness of the match, the, yeah. the way they just, I mean, they just had a good, brutal beat down mm-hmm. sort of match, uh, you yeah. know, just both sides. And yeah, like you said, the way they ended it, it wasn't over the top. It wasn't someone pummeled the other into, into, unconsciousness it was just a a an opponent seeing that he, he was cornered it was checkmate at that point and it was like yes. I, I quit i i need to maintain my health and to your point it's logical it, yes. like you don't fault aj styles in that situation from doing that and then like you said you know i think what they were trying i think the story they were trying to go for is cody you know it, like they did this weird thing where he's looking at his mom like you know are you okay like somehow divining mm-hmm. that she was threatened by him at some point and maybe this was his come up and getting the, the the stares nonetheless but mm-hmm. but if you take that out of it to well, your point it kind of felt like yeah he was riding the heel side of this a little bit you know like screw you i'm still going to lay into you for this and boom yeah well it almost felt like she he was almost like asking permission in a weird way when again yeah. and that's and that's kind of where i feel like it got a little bit. It got a little weird, mm-hmm. uh, but again, like that's something that down the road, that amb- ambiguity can really get useful. Oh yeah, yeah. you know, and yeah, no, this it and was, it was poetic too because when Styles did his fake retirement, right, the whole thing ended with him doing a Styles clash off those stairs, and it ends with him laying the stairs into Styles. So I mean, yeah. I thought it was kind of a nice True, way to I bring it around, that. you know, um, with the story they were telling. Yeah. And I like how, you know, with the, um, at one point, and I kind of wish they'd leaned into it a little bit more. I think AJ at one point waved off, or was it Cody, waved off the ref with a mic. And, you oh, know, yeah. Like, like, no, don't ask him. Like, mm-hmm. there needs to be more punishment. And I kind of wish there had been a little bit more to that. Like, no, don't you dare ask him. I don't want him to quit yet. Mm-hmm. That sort of thing. Like, yeah. that, that almost 
but of course, I think that goes down the road. What I think is great is the fact that so many people are like, oh, well, of course, yeah, his first match is going to be against AJ because, well, he needs to get his feet wet or this and that. Or everyone's like, oh, you know, the, this first rivalry of Cody Rhodes as champ already sucks and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, nah, this actually, this feels like this could have some legs. Like, this feels like it could stretch to SummerSlam. Yeah. And quite easily, maybe even a little bit beyond that. But I mean, if they go to all the way to SummerSlam, I ain't got no problem with that. I think that'd be. I think this is a nice little few that and and two guys who work really well together. Yeah, yeah, have great matches and who can both friggin' talk. Yep. I mean, what else do you want? Like, yeah, maybe maybe WWE under you know Rassel and Voldemort, you know, did not do as well by AJ Styles as they could have. Well, this is a guy who obviously is a is a star still. Yeah. Why not use him? Yep. You know, and I think they're doing very well with that. Agreed. You know, it almost feels like that at this point. <laughs> if you, you remember the money uh, movie Moneyball? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and Brad Pitt's talking to David Justice. Yep. And he's like, I want to soak every last bit of baseball. I want to squeeze you. the last bit of baseball out of you and you want to stay in the game. Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it almost feels like 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 H is like, how about this? <laughs> right on. <laughs> Well, and interestingly enough, we're, I mean, I'm not saying this is the same pattern because I, I honestly don't see a third match here because, you know, Cody's won one, two. And yeah, but I, I kind of feel like there's un, unless they do rope. SummerSlam as a retirement match for, for AJ. Like if AJ loses, he's not just loses. He's re, he's retired. Like, well, but that could be interesting if he retires and then shows back up in TNA now with a little bit of crossover they have going and has yeah. like one last run is like, OK, yeah, I retire from WWE. Yeah, you yeah, know, that sort of thing. That could be kind of cool. Yeah, especially if he's like, as long as I'm getting WWE money, mm. I don't mind going to TNA. Yeah, I don't want TNA money. <laughs> but but I like how like Backlash was him and Styles in more mm. of a respect match. Yeah. Then Cody has you know another title defense after that. I'm forgetting who who that was with. Right? Wasn't after Backlash or no? Am I or or was no? There was a pay per view after Backlash, wasn't there? Or am I? Gosh, I am completely f- blanking on this now. Yeah, because King King and Queen of the Ring. Oh, King and Queen of the Ring. So, oh, okay. he fought Logan Paul. That's right. He yes. fought Logan Paul, beat him, and then he comes back. Like it feels very much like last year with Brock. Right? He fights Brock, mm-hmm. barely beats him. Mm-hmm. Then Brock wins the second match, and then they have their blow off match at SummerSlam. And it kind of yeah. feels like they're doing a similar thing here, where they're stretching out like a series of matches against. Which I like. I, I like that sort of long term storytelling, and thankfully they're invested in that now yeah. because they're not being ruled by you know the eighty year old you know man child. So I like um, the retirement angle. The more the more I think about it, that's a hell of an idea, especially where they've been kind of harping so much on like AJ is long in the tooth and he's been around so yep. long, and that would be great. But th- there was a thing on WrestleMania where talking about where he he's kind of hinted like that he wouldn't mind going and wrestling in TNA. Mm-hmm. especially where now there seems to be this, you know, open door policy between the two promotions. Like that would actually be really cool. That would, that would actually yeah. be really awesome. Cause I mean, he was such a stalwart in TNA. Oh, SummerSlam's I mean, in Cleveland. I, I was wondering if it was going to be in Atlanta. Cause that's where it Well, yeah. Lived. So SummerSlam is at the Browns. It's at the ballpark. Stadium. Well, no, this, it, the SmackDown before it is at the ballpark. Oh, oh, is that what it was? Okay. And then they're okay. at the Browns. They're at the football stadium for the actual event. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. That's and I mean, cool. that's the ballpark is going to sell. I mean, that's a decent sized ballpark. Yeah. That's not like, you know, oh, yeah, we can only fit 20,000 people in here. Like, no, it's it's not just a glorified like you can fit 30, 40,000 people in there and they might fill it for Smackdown before SummerSlam. Like, mm-hmm. holy good God. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're going to two nights for SummerSlam next year. Doing bigger numbers than AEW for sure. All right. Like house shows do bigger numbers than <laughs> AEW. Amen and amen. All right. Portland, Maine, they do bigger numbers than AEW. Moving I, anything else on the I quit match? No, we I I All dragged right. that out. Sorry. Uh women's tag team championship triple threat. Alba Fire and Isla Dawn uh defeated uh in kind of an upset because I don't think anyone oh, totally. was expecting them to do it. Bianca Belair and Jade Cargill, who were the incumbent champions, and mm-hmm. Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark, uh, who are the challengers. Uh, this one was interesting, but for probably the wrong reasons <laughs> for the fan base. If, if the star Wars fan base is awful when it comes to some of the, uh, 
ladies that are in the franchise, well, WWE has their share of malcontents as well. And oh, uh, yeah. we, we, we had a bit of a botch uh, in terms of a top rope maneuver by Cargill. We also had her and, and I, and you know, I don't know if this was part of the story or not, or if this was, you know, kind of a, um, uh, an improv, uh, or, an, or, or, you know, just ad libbing by, by Michael Cole, but there was a point in the match where it did seem like she was tapping out when ba- Baszler had her in a kind of a chokehold. Mm. I don't think that was what she was intending to do, but th- when you watch it, you're like, holy crap, she looks like she's tapping out. Yeah. And that where, be- you know, there's one thing where, where they're like struggling with their arms and it's like, you know, they're trying to like get some momentum or something. And unfortunately she wasn't moving her arm. She was just kind of like, you know, it's like, no, no, no. You don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. But I've seen, I've seen some guy wrestlers. I've seen other people do that where I'm like, yeah, that looks, that's, it's not a tap, but it's starting to head that direction. Yeah. 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 Which I like how they did. I, I like how they did tone into that or, or key into that on raw the next night. That was yeah. interesting, which yeah, I agree. That was kind of cool. I agree. Um, so I, I will put, I'm going to try and put this in the show notes, but there was a, uh, a bit from Wrestle, WrestleMania today about the botches, mm. uh, the rope botches, especially yeah. at Clash. And apparently the, uh, the ropes apparently were not as tight as ah. they usually are. And okay. I'm not sure why you don't correct that or why that isn't like double and triple checked before, yeah. especially for a PLE. I mean, yeah. I can see like you just got to the town, then you're tearing it down that night, and all. But I mean, it's kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. And apparently, the apparently the ref was telling like AJ Styles before the the first match because, of course, you know the phenomenal forearm. He has mm-hmm. to spring off of the top rope. So there's a thought that you know Cargill's little tumble off of the the top ropes, being looser than normal, as well as you know not being as seasoned, not able to adapt as well yeah. or as quickly. Yeah. Um, or, I mean, just, I mean, we've seen how many wrestlers, like even experienced wrestlers, to get up to the top ropes and a little unsteady mm-hmm. or, or look like, oh, and they kind of manage to correct. So, I mean, it's not just all inexperience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it seems like that was a, a theme, shall we say. I would agree. I would agree. And, and, I, and I read something similar as well, especially when it came to like, you know, what happened to Priest, um, that there was, oh, there God. was just like, it, it wasn't just Cargill. Like there, there were others I think who were struggling with it as well. So I yeah, I'm not sure that was an actual spot. Like I was like, that yeah. has to be a real spot, right? That couldn't have just happened by accident. <laughs> Apparently it can. Well, M- McIntyre ad-libbed very well. I, I will give him credit for that. So, oh yeah. Everybody did in that situation. That was like. I, I imagine in his head he's like, the hell? Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, but this one surprised me. I thought this was gonna be another win by Cargill and and uh in Bel Air. Um mm-hmm. I think they did a nice job using, you know, kind of the triple threat uh mm-hmm. aspect in, in in a logical and kind of interesting way where, you know, Cargill lands her finisher or or sorry, Cargill and Bel Air land their finisher, and then they're essentially like both blocked um, by the other team members with, you know, basically I, th- I figure it was Isla Don or Alba fire who, who made the pin. Mm. Um, but taking basically credit for the finishing maneuver that they didn't execute, um, yeah. and winning the tag team championship. So I, I think it'll be interesting where they go from there, but I, I thought it was a, a good match. Um, there's definitely kind of a formula that they're developing with Cargill where, you know, Bel Air's kind of the the Ricky Morton baby face in peril and then she tags in the monster uh to to kind of clean house and yeah and they do a nice job of showcasing her um you know I I, I will say I think there was a little bit of a, a botch as well when she did her when they did the finisher um it's it, it just something about it seemed off or or I, I think it was also when Cargill was kind of approaching her like rather you know you're kind of expecting her to jump on her to pin her and mm-hmm. she was just kind of taking her time so I you know, just little things there, but um, but overall, I thought it was really well done. I I looked up uh, Alba Fire situation because they kept you know talking about how she had been through there had been a family tragedy, and yeah, I guess like she lost her mom, like her her mom got struck by a car just like crossing the street or something like that, and she was you know basically killed. Um, and oh, so it was just very sudden and and sort of thing, and so uh. So it, it was, in, you know, it was interesting in the press conference afterwards because I watched Triple H's section of it and he was pretty adamant. He's like, you know, I, I know a lot of people think we, you know, they won the belts because of that. He's like, that's not at all what influenced that choice. He's like, this was 
this was the direction we wanted to go in and and this was determined before any of this stuff happened you know i mean it's interesting how open he is about that stuff because i think he yeah. you know he he wants to be transparent and just kind of be like look these these girls earned the spot you know like this is not a, a hand me you know a gift that we're giving them they they earned it you know sort of thing and and good on yeah. him for for doing that because you know they're I, I wouldn't say I, I've been locked into whatever they've been doing and know of them very well. I know they've been around for a while. And so I think it's, you know, it's good to see talent who's put in the time, kind of get that recognition. So, yeah, I mean, and the fact is, I mean, they, from from what I gleaned from their resume being read mm -hmm. during the match, uh, because I, I don't. You know, I, I, I don't follow the shows every single week and know the entire roster by heart. Seems like, you know, both of the both Alba Fire and Isla Dawn are fairly well decorated in, in the NXT sense. Yeah. And uh, yep. you know, it really seems like you don't you don't lean that far into individuals in developmental and then, you know, bring them up. <laughs> well, <laughs> unless you're wrestling Voldemort. And then you just do that for kicks. Um, but if you're interested in 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 actually drawing money, um, you kind of follow through on that. So it and to me it made made the most sense looking back in retrospect i'm like yeah i don't think they're ready to take the belt off of bailey especially for piper niven and i was like there's got to be something happening here with drew i don't think they're ready to take the belt off of priest so it's like yeah this seems mm -hmm. like the best one to like because they had the, out of the five matches you've got three <laughs> that are weighted towards scotland i'm like this is the one where you can get away with this yep. and it works um because quite honestly like Belair and Cargill don't necessarily need the belt. It's good. It helped them get established, but having them chase and be in the mix is fantastic for them. Like they have so much charisma just on their own. They don't need it. Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark, I gotta say, I'm kind of warming up to them as a team. Like maybe they actually have something that's gonna work for Shayna Baszler. Mm -hmm. I kind of hope because I think that she's kind of a badass and could work. Her mic skills not fantastic you know yeah. but whatever that that might work so it kind of to me business wise this made the most sense and it was actually a pretty entertaining match like just the way that the the way it flowed i mean a couple of mistakes here to the side but overall i mean not too bad i mean especially considering you have to follow up that first match oh yeah and the yeah. crowd was into it which to me is like you the women involved did a great job because that's usually like where the air is going to get sucked out of the place after mm -hmm. a huge match at the beginning like that. So they did a great job, like keeping that crowd stoked. I would agree. Excellent. Would agree. All right. Uh, next one, uh, intercontinental championship, uh, mm. Sammy Zayn versus Chad Gable. Um, I actually was kind of rooting for Chad to, to win this one. Um, how can you root for someone named Chad? I don't know. I, I, you know, it, it kind of cracks me up back when when Kurt Angle was was uh, you know kind of having his final run in WWE, and they were running this, they're going to run this story. Um, and it was actually Gable's partner, Jason Jordan, was going to be like, you know, the long lost son of of Kurt Angle. And I, I I look at Chad Gable, and I'm like, Gable is literally like a freaking twin of of Kurt Angle. Like, I mean, how would you not go or, with him yeah. as that? What's that? He's a little bit smaller, but yeah. No, but I'm saying like, yeah, but, but play the son of Kurt Angle. I mean, that would have fit like perfectly. Like there's the mannerisms, the the way he conducts himself, the the oh, fact yeah. that he's like this like technical well, wrestler. It was like, why did you not go with Gable? Um, and I unfortunately like for Jason detriment. Jordan, he had a he had a much shorter career because of injury and so forth. But, I feel like that's been to his but, detriment uh, to be. But yeah, no, I, I was thinking blown. Gable was going to take it here. Yeah, I'm I kind of. You know, because there was, there's been, of course, the, the talk of his contract coming up, and he re-signed with WWE, and there was word mm -hmm. that you know, kind of seemed like opinion was like, wow, he's he's probably done with WWE because he hasn't really gone anywhere, he mm -hmm. hasn't really seen a lot of action or anything like that. He's probably going to go to AEW at least make some money. Yeah, and he stayed with WWE, and then apparently afterwards was quoted as saying, like on some podcast or something or rather, like you know, he was kind of given an outline of where triple H kind of wanted to go with things and like everything that he's, that Levesque said has happened and yeah. he's been, you know, try he's been kind of worked into things. And so given that background information, I'm like, I don't think he's going to win this. However, they're going to find some way to keep this rolling. And, and, and he is, he's definitely not going to get 
less TV time. Like this is going yeah. to be more TV time. Like this yeah. is going to be another step towards him kind of losing it, you know? Uh, but hell of a match. Yeah. Hell of a match. hundred percent. You know, Sami Zayn again is like just the king of getting his ass kicked. Yes. And, and just not giving up. Um, just another guy who I'm like, and like that body type and you're a professional wrestler. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> right on. Whatever. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was a great match. Um, you know, I, I, I liked, uh, I liked the action. I like, um, you know, the, the story they were telling in it. Um, of course, inevitably you had to have, you know, Otis and mm. Maxine, you know, kind of get, get, you know, woven into it. And, uh, you know, I love, I love the whole sequence when, uh, like, I forget if it was it Sammy who threw Chad into Maxine or so, something happened where Chad like clipped yeah. Maxine or something like that. And, and just the, like the, the crowd just like looking at Otis, you know, and, and, yeah, like, and Otis and his facials and every, Oh my God. It was just so, so it, well it really done. is one of those moments where like they've worked this to the point where you, and I don't know if I agree with this. Like they've really played up Otis as almost like, the most simple of simpletons. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was almost like the crowd it, all turning to him once like, what else do you need? Yes. Walk the guy. Beat the tar out of him. Come on now. And and instead, I mean, he did the he did the right thing, yep. you know, carries Maxine off. But it's like like okay, you can only make him look so simple before it's like, okay, is he even like should he even be allowed to be out there without a diaper? Like, is he going to soil himself? Like you, you kind of have to give him some native intelligence, yeah. you know, and they, they kind of did, they kind of did on, on raw. They managed mm-hmm. to bring him back, but it was mm-hmm. sort of, even that moment. It was sort of like, really? Like what else? Yeah. Um, yeah. But then we got the answer the next night. So it all works out. Or but two. but it was interesting that, that Gable's downfall was his, over reliance on his family, you know, to yes. get involved and cheat for him and that sort of thing. And of course it led to the Haluva kick, which, uh, which I got to say has got to be the most interesting pronunciation. Like I'll, I, I always thought it was hell of a hell of a kick. <laughs> Who would have thought, but you know, yeah. but no, that's the Haluva kick. Um, and, uh, Sammy puts him away, you know, I'm not, I'm not minding Sammy's run with the title. I think it's no. great. I think he's doing great work with the title and, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, ready, you know, for a, a new challenge, which we'll get into in a moment with, uh, mm. with raw, but no, I, 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 I am not opposed to the, the outcome of this. Um, I'm just kind of curious where they're going with the Gable character, especially now that he's re-signed and to your point, you know, there's clearly a vision for where his character's going. So, um, you know, I, I especially liked after the match when they would like zoom in on Gable, um, in the ring, like just ready to snap, you yeah. know, like do something with that now. Like, mm-hmm. like I was almost disappointed the next night on raw, it was back to the comedy, you know, Gable with the, with alpha Academy again. And it's just well, like, I think that was done for a reason. All right. And we'll talk about that a little. All later. right. Uh, next match, WWE women's championship. Bailey defends against Piper Niven, another uh, uh, home yes. hometown lady. Uh, yep. Going to serve this one up because well, lives busy with Dom. So we need to have, you yes. know, we need to have one of the titles defended and Liv's trying to get Dom's vest. <laughs> hey, would you look at that? We've got a we've got another another person from Scotland. Let's throw them in the match out of nowhere getting a championship shot, which I, I think caught a little bit of flack online, but I'm like, dude, this is how wrestling has always worked. Like the yep. hometown person is always gonna get, you know, a spot because you're trying to draw in the crowd. Like like really? Do you don't think this has been going on since like the twenties? Uncle Agreed. Corny, can you please lecture people on how this has worked? You know, yeah. well, let me tell you now. Um, however, I w- my one match was, you know, the match was what it was. I don't think it was fantastic. I don't think it was terrible. Um, I just feel like they need to figure out what they're going to do with Bailey in terms of like presentation. Yeah. yeah. Like the theme, the because they tried bringing her out with like the Egyptian wings at wrestlemania which i was like what the fracking hell is this um and the theme and everything just doesn't seem right like i don't know what it is but bailey is so freaking over with fans Mm -hmm. fans love her i've been clamoring her for to be the champ and all that and they got her it just feels like there's something off in terms of the presentation and once you fix that we're off to the races now you're 
you're firing on all eight cylinders, but now it feels like there's five and a half and there's this weird clumping noise coming from underneath the hood. Um, but still had a, I mean, had a pretty good match with Piper and I, I think Piper did, did pretty well being put in a situation that I don't think she's really been in, mm-hmm. uh, since being in WWE. I mean, she's like strictly lower mid card. Yeah. Yeah. For her no, run. no, I, I, I thought it was a serviceable match. I, I agree with you. So there, there's something missing and, and, you know, some of this might be on me not watching the weekly shows as much as, uh, or, or, you know, catching up on YouTube with the clips. Like, I don't know what the build to this match was like, I, and that may have affected my investment in it a little bit. Mm. It's like, I think it was literally like Piper coming out and saying, I've been around for a while. I want a right. challenge. I want a title shot. And so, you, you know, like w- when you lack that, it's hard to get invested in, in the characters because it's mm. like, what's, what's the motivation? I, you know, that was one of the, the criticisms of the first Cody, uh, AJ match was mm-hmm. why are they fighting? You know I mean? Like, great. They have a lot of respect for each other. It's going to be like a face versus face match, but like, what's, what's the hook to really get me excited about it? You know? And, and, you know, this I quit match was a complete turn, you know, from, from that first match into, okay, I'm hooked onto this match because I want to see Cody beat the hell out of AJ. Um, and so that's what I was kind of struggling with was, you know, like I get it. She's the hometown girl. She's getting a shot. I didn't think she was really going to win. Um, you know, I just felt like this was a title defense for Bailey in, in her hometown and she was, you know, going to get her shot, but she wasn't going to win. And, uh, and you know, the, the match was pretty much, you know, kind of color by numbers for, for me a little bit, you know, it, it was a good match. Um, you know, the women worked, you know, hard. I don't want to devalue it in any way, mm-hmm. but it also wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't a match where I stopped what I was doing. And I'm like, Oh crap, this is something I got to watch. You know, it was, it was good background noise and, and, you know, I would watch it a little bit here or there, but it just didn't, I don't know. There just wasn't a lot of investment on my side into it. And, and part of that could be on me. So, yeah, no, I, I don't think you're that far off. Cause I mean, I got to admit I was, I was watching it, but I'm like, I for for I kept on just going with wow, this is pretty good for Piper, like you know this was better than what I expected. My my expectations were low. Wow, you you exceeded my expectations, not like through the roof, mm-hmm. but you exceeded them. Yeah, you know by like five yeah. percent. Good, you know, good on you. Um, but yeah, no, there was no way if they had if they had given Niven a title, I'm like okay, they better have some sort of grand plan here because this don't make much sense for business because. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know, but yeah, no, this was, it was, it was serviceable and it's also, you know, it doesn't help that you then come off of like three, you know, big matches. Yeah. One of them, I mean, I think the triple threat was probably looked at as like, all right, this is kind of a come down match and it didn't end up being. No. The crowd is going to come down at some point and I think they decided here. They yeah. Decided, hey, let's ease ourselves because our boy's coming out next. <laughs> right. Right. No, nope. you know? totally agree. Totally agree. Because it's funny because they were rooting for Bailey. Yeah. For about 50% of the match until all of a sudden I think someone caught on like, oh, wait, we should be rooting for Piper because she's from here. And then they started <laughs> cheering. I'm like, did someone start holding up a sign? <laughs> like, was, was there like messages on the Jumbotron? Like, hey, by the way, you know Piper's from here, right? She's Scottish. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what they odd. say? If it's not Scottish, it's cop. <laughs> Which brings us to the World Heavyweight Championship match, the main yes. event of the evening. Uh, Damian Priest defending his World Heavyweight Championship against uh, the Scottish Warrior Drew McIntyre, and uh, my goodness, uh, what a what a slobber knocker this was! But man, did it take a weird turn, uh, you know, not too long into the match with uh, Damian Priest going for what I can only assume was an aerial assault over the top rope to the outside and. His foot got caught on the ropes, and he yeah. just swung right down and slammed into the side of the ring. A one-footed hangman, if you will. And, and you know, McIntyre was interesting to look at because he just kind of fell backwards like he was taking the hit, you know, like kind of doing the normal yeah. like, fall that he was expecting. And then he kind of pops up like, what the hell just happened? Yeah. <laughs> you know, this one's, remember the story of Mick Foley's bio- biography where he talks about, like, there was one guy who uh, who got hit with a box of popcorn. Mm. and thought it was a, his opponent and took a bump over the top rope and it was like a it was a battle royal so he lost the battle royal on taking a bump from a box of popcorn yeah yep that's almost what that feels like a little bit like he's taking it in anticipation then probably yeah. midway down was like 
how come he didn't make it? What the hell are you doing hanging up there? Yeah. <laughs> Blood. Oh, I, I, I better get up. <laughs> and and watching McIntyre's like reaction to it, it's almost like half like concern he had for Priest, you know, as a competitor and as uh-huh. his colleague. But then at the same time, th- then he starts kicking him in the ri- like. It, like I love how he went from from safety concern to okay, let's keep the match going. I'm going to boot you around. And then there was a point where he's talking to the ref, and he's like, "I can't win this way. I'm going to come in and get him out." Like like, yeah. and then Cole picks up on, and he's like, "He's going to free him because he can't beat him." You know, it's like one of these things. Like, okay, we're going to get him out of this this situation, but do it in yep. the most story centric way we can do it, which is. Drew can't win the belt if, if he's tied up like this. So, which just goes to show, like what a you know ring general the Absolutely. dude is. Like, like that is because at, at a certain point, like you're concerned, like okay, he's conscious, dangling there. He yep. might have a broken leg. He might have a you know wrenched whatever. But we got to keep this sucker going. This is the main event. Yep. So, uh, hey, buddy, brace yep. incoming. <laughs> yeah. And and credit to Priest, you, you know, when, when he, you know, when the match kind of got back into the ring and he was, you know, he was executing some, some of his standard moves and, mm-hmm. and doing it on like one foot, like, like he, when he did the razor's edge, I don't know if you noticed that he was standing on his one good foot when he finally yeah. dropped him because he clearly didn't feel comfortable or felt stable on the other one. And so I, I thought that was very interesting to see how he was adapting you know, yeah. throughout the match. Um, and apparently he's not injured. Like in that same yeah. WrestleMania video I'll, I'll post, it's, they kind of went with, he's, he was just selling really well. Yeah. And everyone assumed like he's got to be hurt. That's too gnarly. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, just, just a great, you know, great, great work by both, both competitors in, in the match. I, I thought it was a really competitive match. It was, mm. it was really well done. Both of them throwing, you know, all of their best offense at each other. And then, you know, uh, both of them getting near falls on each other. And, you know, and I was wondering how this is going to work because because I knew there was going to be a punk, so, oh, yeah. some sort of involvement of punk. I was half expecting him to be like like a, a special guest announcer sort of thing at the beginning of the match. They'd introduce him and he'd be at the mm-hmm. ringside and get involved or something. But what an absolutely just innovative or, or, or just just creative way to bring oh. him into the match with the ref getting knocked out. Well, no, but the thing is, like, this has happened many times before. Yes. What made it innovative was the fact that they were so on with the camera angles. Yes. The like, camera this was, angle was perfect. This was blocked like a Hollywood fight scene to have just the right angles. Mm-hmm. Because the only thing that gave it away to me was, like, I'm like, those are Jordans. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's uh I don't think that's Charles Robinson and I don't think uh you know honestly uh, the slick tack the slick back hair kind of gave it away from true. me a little bit yeah. when he starts kind of like oh that's got to be him and then sure enough when he stops it too and he's like and he's got the look that no one does the shit eaten grin better oh, than CM Punk <laughs> no <laughs> well and the fact was then when they go across the ring Oh my god! And you see McIntyre, and you see the ref come up. That's when you first see Punk, like, and he kind of rises up. Yeah, and yep. he's given, and he's showing him too. But that's also like, you know, if you're doing that, and oh right, right. Oh, you know, I didn't even pick up on that. Now that you mentioned it, it's like I'm right there. So it's like, uh, like I was oh, like, that's so beautiful, genius, genius, and, and that along with the the grin, like you're saying, like, oh come on, dude, that's. <laughs> <laughs> And then the way like McIntyre like you know gets him in the goozle. <laughs> oh yeah, goes to well, goozle him. He, he and... goozled him, and then he 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 got the kick to the uh, the, well, the, the area thing you is, don't want to be kicked. Punk knows a uh, thing or two about the goozle. He does. He knows, he knows how to break when, the goozle. So. Yeah, he's he's put many many a person in the goozle, grab the <laughs> goozle pipe, and he knows. Well, I know one sure way out of this situation. <laughs> oh my gosh! And then the way he the jungle like, boy wish he knew this uh, indeed. <laughs> And then, like, after he boots him, the way he just kind of, like, takes him and just throws him to the mat, it was, like, just so well done. And then, uh, oh, yeah. and then Priest, you know, put, puts puts it away and, and retains the championship. So, all in all, just an entertaining, just a, a card of, yeah. of, you know, really entertaining matches. And, uh, did yeah, you see I, him afterwards when he was, like, lined up with a couple? He found, like, some CM Punk fans. Yes. And he's, like, yep. saying, he's, like, I thought I was going to get jumped. <laughs> Well, McIntyre did say that. He did threaten him and say, look, if you try to pull anything, man, you're, you know, the Scottish folks are going to beat the, and then of course there's like friendlies there where it's like, oh, we're fans of yours. Oh yeah. yeah. Apparently like they were, the fans uh, were not pleased after that. Like they were booing Samantha Irvin. 
yeah. at the end of the night, like as she's given the good night and it's like, yeah. But then again, I mean, hey, that's what that's kind of what you're signing up for. Indeed. You know, Indeed. that's the drama. So oh, Clash man. at the Castle 24 is behind us and, uh, uh, you know, really solid five five match card. I thought it was yeah. that was well done. Well no done. complaints, really. I mean, here and there and nits to pick, but otherwise. And being the the, uh, you know, students of the wrestling game that we are. And, and I want to give credit to Uncle Todd for making this call last night. We were going to record last night and mm. Uncle Todd texted me and in his best L.A. night impression said, no, no. <laughs> He no, is no, like, I didn't dictate anything. No, no, no. I didn't mean you dictated. I, I just meant you said, no, no, yeah. let's, let's watch raw and let's uh, record tonight and, and see what some of the aftermath is from this event. And, and, you know, that way we're not recording and then something, you know what, uncle Todd student of the game. I, right, I, I just the, want to say uh, cheers to you, sir, for, for that. that I'll be the, the brain Heenan. Just always, right. always thinking, always a step or two ahead. Diabolical genius. In the words of Bubba Ray Dudley. Um, yep. But and, and what a great call because that was it had been a long time since I had watched a Raw from beginning to end. Again, I had it on kind of in the background while I was doing some work. And uh, but no, I mean, just a lot of a lot of really, you know, newsworthy events happening with, you know, Seth Rollins coming back right out the gate. Boom. Like segment one. Hey, yep. we're live and boom. And it's like, oh, hey, look, who's back? Welcome back. Anyways, uh, yeah, that was kind of cool. And then gets like an immediate title oh. shot. Yeah. Yeah. With El Campion. I mean, wh- one thing I got to say, like, I know I, I'm trying to figure out what they're doing with Priest. Mm-hmm. Like, whether they're trying to turn him face or what. His promo work is just in this weird in between spot where he's not working heel, but he's also not completely mm-hmm. going babyface, and yeah. in a in a way, it becomes very bland. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that it, like it, in some ways, it makes him look dumb. Hmm. And I don't feel like his character is a dumb character, no. you know. So that's the one thing I I I would nitpick with that. But yeah, great segment just to start things off. And I mean, of course, good God, people are eight shades of pink to, you know. Sing his song. And, oh yeah, you know. Oh, I mean, jeez, yeah. it's good to see him so back. Over. It's oh good yeah, to see him back. The the dark night to Cody Superman. So, uh, but nonetheless, yeah, good to see uh, him back. And yeah, very interesting and intriguing title match at Money in the Bank mm. uh, with Priest defending against Rollins. So we'll see where where they go there. Um, Which to me makes a lot of sense because rather than having Seth have to wrestle his way through Money in the Bank and take that away mm-hmm. from someone else, this kind of seems like a really good way to kind of launch that in there. Yep, and kind of keep things rolling until SummerSlam, and you know, I don't know, just it to me it opens up a lot of possibilities. And it's and it's unclear like to me where like what direction they would go, and I feel like they would want to ride Priest at least until SummerSlam. Mm. And then have Gunther, uh, you know, kind of crown, you know, be crowned the the new champion. I could also see him go a route where Rollins wins back the belt, and then gets decimated by by Gunther in, in SummerSlam. Either way, I I I, I see the ring general uh, whooping on whoever is champion. Um, you know, I, yeah. I I just see that being the way it's going to go because I think it's time for him to ascend to the world championship. I mean, he's. He he held the Intercontinental Championship for well over two years. Um, he's it's held time. the NXT Championship for over eight hundred days, which however many years that is, three plus. It's time. It is Gunther time. <laughs> I don't see that being his new theme. No. Okay. Uh, I, I, also I, I was just trying to workshop that a little. King General, but <laughs> the King. That's nice. I haven't heard that. That is. That is. Uh, and then we move on to later uh, in in the show. We had the uh, the IC belt. Uh, we had Sami Zayn come out, declare Chad Gable mm. is uh, had his shot, and now he's looking for for new new blood. And we have Braun Breaker interject himself. We have Sheamus interject himself into that, and then that leads to a match between Sheamus and Breaker, where Sheamus is basically a sweaty mess within five minutes. And <laughs> Just but, sweating like. Bacon grease. It was not good. It's not a good look, Seamus. Like I'm, but, you, I know the brawling brute days are done. Yeah, you know all that. But it's like if there's one time that they should be bringing back like Seamus wrestling in, in in like 
in like the white tank top Mm -hmm. and the jeans now's the time yeah i would agree it's okay seamus like it catches like father time catches up with all of us you're not at your physical best right now yes Yes. go ahead and feel and feel free to like disguise or whatever you need to do keep the aura keep the aura Mm -hmm. uh but yeah but i gotta say it was great to see him face braun breaker though because with breaker being kind Mm. of this you know, high impact, you know, wrecking machine sort of character that it was great to have him kind of go up against the, you know, kind of, kind of the, the, the weathered veteran a little bit, the, the guy yes. that used to be kind of like what Breaker was. I mean, that, that was Seamus. Yeah. He was the brawling Irishman. And, uh, well, but and, there's a difference between a brawler and just like the, the demolition machine. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, and I, and I appreciate, I, I did enjoy the match. Yeah. Yeah, like magic. in a, in this weird way, even though it's t- a bunch of times I was feeling bad for Seamus because I'm like, oh, dude, lost a step or just not quite moving the way you'd want. But yeah, but that it almost played into the contrast. Yeah. You know, and it kind of makes me wonder, like, is it just because Braun is that freaking fast mm-hmm. that it made Seamus look that much slower? But I do. I, I love the fact that like just Seamus is not going to stop. Yeah. Like, he is just going to like you can go ahead. He's He's rocky. Like you mm-hmm. can just beat the living hell out of him and he'll just still get up and be like, all right, come on. Yep. Bring like, it. What do you have to do with this dude? Like put a stake through him, you I know, could do this all day long. Oh, it's good. But yeah, uh, that was, it was, it definitely, it, I liked how that kind of like the, the initial like confrontation happened and then it broke down to Seamus and, and Braun. And then you have Sammy just sort of like, just sort of like sliding into the yeah. background between the two of them. Sounds like you two want a match. Because <laughs> <laughs> you talk about like CM Punk having that grin, like yep. Sammy kind of does that sort of like, eh? like the background stuff yep. as well as anybody. And oh, it, yeah. it just so work there, uh, like comedic, but also works storyline wise. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of digging like this, like this other little angle we're getting on Sammy Zane. You yeah. Know? Yep. Um, but yeah, that was a little bit of intrigue going on in the IC belt division, especially with okay, now Gable is and his little bit with Adam Pierce. Mm-hmm. Adam Pierce, as usual, just looking flummoxed and flustered, <laughs> but managing to handle Chad, Chad Gable all right. Yep. Um, but Roman uh, the ring with Braun Strowman. <laughs> yeah, oh, I got the perfect guy for you. Oh, just let him just get thrown pillar to freaking post. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. That was great. It was. It um, was. But also great. I mean, we finally got to see Otis. Like, mm-hmm. did not beat the hell out of Chad, but uh, did enough throw him away. And it was just like, all right, we're out. Um, I, I was a little disappointed by that. I was hoping there'd be a little bit of, uh, you know, some fist thrown there. You know, yeah. I, I, w- I want to see Otis open up a little bit. Oh, well, I think they're waiting on that. I, yeah. I think that I think that there is going to be, I think there's going to be some interaction between uh, the featured uh, performers in our final segment Mm. and the remnants of Alpha Academy. I think this is going to all play in together. I think this is going to be the first initial bit of that, right. if you will. Right. Um, what was what's the what's the third member of the Alpha Academy there though? Oh, uh Akira uh, 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 Tazawa? Akira Tazawa. Yeah. 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 I love I I did love the bit where JK was like another night off. <laughs> <laughs> That was good. That was good. That that moment, I'm like, all right, I know you're a heel, but that was funny, right? There. That, that was funny. that was a good line. That was funny. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, oh, and then uh, just jumping back to the IC title picture, uh, we have Ludwig Kaiser injecting himself into the yes. Seamus uh, Braun Breaker drama, and uh, which doesn't do him any favors. He looks like so thin compared to those two guys. Like yeah. even thinner than normal. Like he looks like a stick He's figure built, compared though. to the. T- he, he, he is. Built. But- but you put him in the you put him up next to the like Seamus and you know burger after burger after burger Seamus and 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 then Braun Breaker who's like mm-hmm. cut from a piece of marble and then you have Ludwig coming down there's like, bah, 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 da, 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 da. And like <laughs> who the hell's this guy <laughs> I know I know but we 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 did have the visual of the night though uh, and I wasn't this is when I was kind of doing split viewing between the Celtics and wrestling but. So so it looks like Kaiser gets some shots in on Sheamus. I think he was setting him up on oh, the yeah, stairs like or something like that. Get his and, knee, yeah. And he was going to run around the ring to go get him. And they do this like wide shot. And you see mm-hmm. Breaker running also and and spearing the crap out of, of Kaiser was just amazing. Like what a great visual that was. 
I wonder what the backstage discussion of that was. Like, yeah. this is going to hurt a lot. And Breaker was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm not the one taking this. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Like, speared him out of his shoes. Like, I'm really surprised it wasn't like one of those car wrecks where they find a shoe like 80 yards down the road or something. Like, yeah. oh, my goodness. And then Breaker getting a shot in on Zane at the end, and Zane just like losing his crap was was mm. phenomenal. So it'll be interesting to see where they go with that. Um, you know, one thing we didn't list here, I'm kind of surprised this isn't in the raw fallout list, is uh, Drew McIntyre coming out and quitting. How did I miss? Oh man, you I missed that. It. But that's okay. Let's talk about it now because that was pretty cool. Like it yeah. was great to see unhinged McIntyre. Like I can't say a word. I'm leaving. <laughs> Well, and then then the follow up in later on where like Drew McIntyre has now deactivated all of his social yeah. media, and I'm like, this is like, okay, this is something that wouldn't have happened before. Nope. Continuity, now, ladies and gentlemen, continuity. Like realizing, like, hey, here's something that we can utilize that we don't have to ignore, or whatever. Like we can utilize this as part of the storytelling. I'm like, yep. that's well done, well done. Yeah, no, I thought that was I thought that was great, just the way it was done. Where it was literally like, you know, you could tell like he's starting and then just like, yep. F this. <laughs> yeah. And and I love how they went even backstage and he and he talks to Triple H, like, like Triple H tries to push the camera away and you don't hear mm-hmm. everything, but you catch a little bit of, he's like, I heard you at the press conference. He's got you fooled too. And then he's just like, and Triple H's like, I don't know what's, you know, it was, just, yeah. it was just great. You know, it was just a nice little touch where they brought in some of the. The, mm-hmm. the the reality of the press conference into the storyline as well, where he feels like, every, you know, he's duped everyone. I'm the only one who can see him for what he really is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, I thought that was really cool. So, so we have, and so my prediction, prediction, uh, pain uh, is, is this Friday at SmackDown. Uh, if Punk has embarrassed Drew McIntyre in his home country of Scotland, why do I get the feeling that McIntyre is going to embarrass Punk in his hometown of Chicago as he is supposedly announcing his return to the, to uh, you know active active yeah. uh, the active roster and that sort of thing, so I, I'm going to be very curious if we see a beatdown of some kind or something else. But this this feud mm. is one of the best things they have going right now. Oh yeah, so, I mean, and a lot of it amazing. has happened on social media with Drew McIntyre. Yes, which is <laughs> McIntyre did his part when Punk couldn't be in front of the camera, and then when Punk can finally be in front of the camera, Punk is doing just his usual brilliance in yeah. in terms of what he's doing. I mean, this the simmer that they're doing on this. Mm-hmm. I really hope they wait until SummerSlam to have these two face off for the first time. Which Don't do why, it at Money in the Bank. Do it at no, SummerSlam. Which is why I felt like you know if 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 McIntyre shows up on SmackDown, it's too soon. However. Mm-hmm. When you factor into the idea that it's Chicago and and yada yada yada, like okay, that makes a that makes more sense. But yeah, then from there on, it has to be yeah, a, it has to be a simmer. There has to be a slow burn because you got to keep these guys apart until then, in some way, shape, or form. And I did read that supposedly on whatever official WWE like sheet on the talent. That Punk is not supposed to be back until the he's not going to be cleared probably till the end of July. So that's what I'm thinking. Are they going to do mm-hmm. like a, a beat down or some sort of thing where it looks like he's taken out again and he comes back in time, you know, so to speak, where, you know, he and McIntyre have their have their blow, you know, have their first match at SummerSlam. I think that'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, I think you're good. You know what? I defer to you on these matters because you are usually more right than I am. Well, I do have my moments. Mm. Uh, you you did touch on the uh, Liv Morgan Dirty Dom drama. That is going to be one hell of a pop whenever oh, um, Rhea, oh, Rhea comes gosh. back. Oh, my gosh. The way they're just building this up, man. Like, if he isn't going to get in trouble with mommy, I don't know what's going to happen. But sweet Moses. <laughs> yeah, and again, another, like, social media thing where it's, mm-hmm. you know, Liv Morgan wishing Dirty Dom a happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. I'm like, oh my gosh. Oh boy. We're we're heading into un mommy not gonna be happy. No. Um no. Yeah. She's gonna adjudicate and not prematurely. Let's just say that. No. <laughs> the thing is, like, they've got to do I I and I, I understand where they're I I think they're trying to get rid of Judgment Day. I think they're mm-hmm. trying to like it needs to go because honestly, you now have these you're gonna have three of these kind of darkish sort of you know more 
serious grim factions. You already have, you know, Carrion mm-hmm. Cross and his little merry band of misfits that aren't doing a whole lot. You got right. Judgment Day where it's supposed to be like the you know, the A version of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you're gonna have our, the stars of our final segment. Like Judgment Day's gotta do something. Like yeah. it feels long overdue and I I feel like the Rhea Dom drama and Liv Morgan is kind of one part of that. I think that El Campion is another I mean, it, it really kind of sucks for what's his face there, McDonough. Um, he's really going to be the odd man out here. You know what I would love to see? Can't we get him in a tag team with R Truth? Well, no, because R Truth is a tag champs with Miz. I know, but at some point, would he just McDonough? Make, like, That'd all be of a sudden, he just kind of forgets the whole thing that happened, and now he thinks he's somebody else. You know, I mean, it would just it would fit. Like it's a good way Could where be. you can kind of now repurpose JD McDonough, you know, out of there, and it and everyone's just like. Oh well, of course. It's kind of like Deadpool with MCU, where they're gonna they're gonna hand wave away a lot of stuff yeah. using Deadpool as their you. get out of jail free card. Like our truth is kind of WWE's Deadpool because yeah. people are just like, oh, we love him, eh, whatever. <laughs> That's how I look at it. Somebody, right. you know, like get Triple H on the phone. I've got some ideas. I I think uh, we we could bring some interesting stuff into WWE if they uh, let us. If yeah, it would be probably on the level of the gobbledygooker, but you know. no, I think it'd be a little bit above gobbledygooker. Maybe not quite brother love, but repo man, <laughs> re- re- repo man. <laughs> I remember that. Of oh God! Remember the intro. <laughs> oh, <goodness. laughs> All right, what about the last segment, sir? Uh, which, which, you know, as I explained to Uncle Todd, uh, my my viewing uh, of of. Uh, you know, of, of the show, uh, you know, about the second quarter of the Celtics game, I, I popped upstairs and watched the, the second half. Uh, my, my wife was kind enough to cast it onto uh, our television set. And in the meantime, I had the phone going with, with uh, Monday Night Raw. And so right at the end of the game, like literally at the point where the Celtics have the game won, yeah. the clock has run out, is literally the point when this segment starts with Uncle Howdy. And I text Uncle Todd and I say, should I be concerned that the Celtics are winning at the same time that Uncle Howdy and crew have decided to grace themselves into the Monday Night Raw zone here? Because, my God, the timing couldn't have been better. Holy moly. Yeah. Um, yes. Very interesting segment that could have really gone off the rails, but it, mm. it ended up, I think it ended up being what they wanted. Oh, yeah. And you I know, love how you, they didn't shy away from the tie to Bray. I mean, the, no. the, this is using the same sort of music and entrance and the way they brought the lights down. Like, it's all mm-hmm. very, if, if we think of Wyatt as the, the oh, Wyatt the light, universe. The sound effect that they yes. used for the lights coming down, exactly what The Fiend used to be. Yep. The, you know, the door, exactly what they did when they reintroduced Bray, you yep. know, when he came back in his most recent run. Uh, the Lantern. I mean, it's like it's it's all of the ties, yeah. not just a couple. It's all the ties. And then at the very end, like Uncle Howdy did not step through the door, stepped around the door mm. almost as a sign of respect, yep. which I kind of dug. Yep. Um, I mean, that had to have been a, a Nikki Cross at the beginning there, right? That it is. Had to- it's going to be Nikki Cross, uh, who is the, 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 the female who kind of crawled out almost like yes. ring style. Um. The I, I forget all of the exact assignments here, but um, Dexter Loomis, uh, who was a, a crazy character from NXT, I'm guessing he was the dude in the gas mask. That's my bet. I think so. Um, you have uh, Eric Rowan, who is um, in the rabbit mask with with uh, the Bludgeon, because uh, he was, of course, one of the Bludgeon brothers uh, back from when he and uh, Luke Harper were a tag team. And then um, who was the other one? Um, his name is Joe Gacy. He was uh, he was kind of playing a little bit of a psychotic, not not quite a. Um, what was the movie De Niro was in where he played the the crazy Cape Fear? Cape Fear. He wasn't quite a Cape Fear sort of character, but he was kind of in that vein a little bit. And so he's he's part of it too. And then of course Bo Dallas, the younger brother of Bray Wyatt, hmm. um, who will uh, be taking taking the uh, the reins of this. So. Very, very interesting uh, debut. Um, what I thought well, was most interesting was almost kind of the violence part of it. Not that it played oh, out yeah. on, on camera, but when they, the, when the camera's kind of zooming through the chaos, you see gorilla position has been completely um, just torn apart. 
and you see like blood. It was more like the blood on the walls. Like you don't that normally like a gunshot. I'm like, wait a minute, what the hell's going on here? Yes. And then there's the close up on Gable of all people. Well, so the one thing before we get to that, as as they're walking through the gorilla, yeah, the last person they show. I, I, I was like, is that Braun Strowman? I thought it was Strowman, too. Yeah. Because that's interesting, because wasn't he part of the original Wyatt family? He was. Um, it'd be something for him to do. Um, but, yeah, and then getting to Gable, uh, who who's they the one that got on. zoomed in on. Like, it was yeah. very clear who that was. He mm-hmm. was the only one we could really identify. Yeah, because going through Gorilla, I mean, it was like, going back there, it was like a couple security people random lights and mic people and all that and i kept looking to see like is triple h like kind of in the moment like right he's like, he's like hey you know what i want to lay over here i almost like a director getting a cameo in a movie like yeah. please just let me lay over here you know yeah. <laughs> sort of thing and i couldn't tell if some of the you know like the match had just concluded with Rey mysterio balor and jay uso mm. jay uso was in the crowd so he wasn't in gorilla but i yeah. i couldn't tell if any of the other folks there were some folks who you're just seeing their back but there was a couple guys who didn't have shirts on, so I didn't, mm-hmm. I couldn't tell if that was Balor and and Mysterio or not. Yeah. you know who were kind of thrown around. Um, yeah, but Gable, they made they made damn sure you knew that was Chad Gable. Oh yeah, yeah, and he was the closest to Uncle Howdy once because they went right from Gable to Uncle Howdy. I mean, mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> so very interesting, very mm. interesting debut, very unsettling. And then mm. of course they come out and and they they do kind of I don't know if it was an homage or not, but. But, you know, they, they pick up the lantern again, tied very much to the Wyatt universe here. Uh, mm-hmm. And and you hear him declare we're here and he blows the lantern out. And that is the end of of the show. And uh, at the same time, our Celtics were celebrating winning a championship. And I was torn between reality <laughs> and fiction. Uh, but it, what a well done fiction it was. Uh, oh, yeah. And, and a great, great way to end the show. Um, Jay Uso, by the way, qualified for Money in the Bank if you cared, but uh, that, yeah, this kind of overshadowed that a little bit. And yeah, so, let's just, let's just yeet that right to the side. Yeet. Uh, uh, although I will give him credit, like I, I, after we've seen the Jay and Jimmy match, like mm-hmm. his matches have been better. I think it was just the two of them wrestling together. Yeah, and someone decided like this is going to be the battle of the super kicks mm-hmm. because since then, like his ring work, I think has been pretty damn good yeah because that was the big thing like watching the two of them like oh my gosh like they're both over but did they forget how to wrestle and yeah. more than like three moves right uh but yeah i mean you know congrats jay good Indeed. for you good Indeed. on you he'll be flying off the ladder with the grace of a gazelle that's not sound it anything more on the raw post clash of the castle no, I mean, a solid show. Solid show. I mean, I don't know what else you want. I mean, that's that's a damn solid show. You for, you furthered a bunch of storylines. You started some others. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say, you know, after watching... Uh, I love the spy montage for Money in the Bank, by the way. Oh, that's fantastic. It, it is. It, it, love that. I don't know why, but it just, I'm like, that makes so much sense what they're doing there. And it's just like, I like it. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Um, I definitely see why, you know, having uh, Isla Dawn and Alba Fire elevate, it makes sense because just watching who, uh, I what was it, Katana and the, the faux rave tag team from the ladies oh, division. Yeah. Um, where they had the belt at one, belts at one point, and I was like, "Wow, yeah, I can t- I can kind of see why you really want to need to build this up because yeah. those two, I just I don't I don't get it. Like, there's just not a whole lot there for me. So I'm like, yeah. watching them in a match, I'm like, and yeah, and damage control, not really any great shakes. I mean, definitely much better, but yeah, some more ladies tags teams would be a good idea. <laughs> We need to beef this up a little bit. Agreed. Um, but no, overall, solid show. Solid show. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what have you got for and another thing, sir? Uh, yeah, this won't be a surprise to many. Uh, my wife and I started watching this uh, last month and uh, have really enjoyed the ride we've been on. We're still working our way through season one. But Star Trek Discovery on, or as I call it, the Plus de Paramount. Uh, yes, all right, ladies and gentlemen, the plus de oh. <laughs> oh. We bring the France to the range of idiocy that is free. The Paramount. Um, uh-huh. 
Uh, but yes, uh, starting out, uh, I think the series actually just wrapped if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I'm, f- I'm a couple. Oh, actually, no, I did. I did. I watched the finale. What am I thinking? Yeah, no, the finale was, uh, uh, it's all flooding back to me now it was really good. Yeah. Very, yeah. very heart stringy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So overall, yeah, just really impressed with it. Um, great cast. Um, we, we just actually wrapped up the episode that kind of closes chapter one of season one and, uh, before it's like separated into chapter one and chapter two, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the, uh, I don't know the character's name. He, he's the uh, scientist who ends up becoming kind of the navigator of the spore drive uh, and how he's about to do his last jump. And he tells his partner how, uh, yeah, there. You know, I, I located this so and so opera that that we can go check out of of uh, their rendition of La Boheme. And of course, as an actor, oh, Anthony Rapp is the actor. He was one yeah. of the key players in. Um, uh, was it Stenitz? Uh, I think so. Um, what what was the play from the nineties though? Rent. He, Rent. He was yeah. one. Of, he was one of the main characters that established yeah. that that as as you know the which the was based on La Boheme. Key. Yeah. The. One of the players that established that as a key show uh, throughout much of the uh, mid to late '90s, um, you know, as part of Broadway. So, I thought that was really cool. Um, and just overall, I mean, I, I so far, the, the the one thing that I'm I'm still struggling a little with a little bit with is the fat is the the time frame of it all because mm. it. You know, I, I see what you had told me about how the ship does kind of mirror or echo a little bit of the older Trek. But still, some of the technology is just so like ahead of where like the Kirk Trek was, you know, like from the yeah. '60s. That it's just like, and I get it, you know, we're we're in the time we're in now, and that was in the time it was in. Well, but you so just follow follow it through. They do actually manage to explain all of that in a fairly logical way. All right, and all right. and it 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 does end up making sense. I just love how Sarek is like such a key character in pretty much every freaking Star Trek franchise. You know, mm-hmm. he just seems to show up. Spock's dad, for as much as Spock is a popular character and Kirk and everyone, Picard, Sarek is everywhere, man. <laughs> He's the glue that holds it together. He is. So if you have not seen this uh, series yet, uh, do do check it out. Star Trek Discovery on Paramount Plus, or as I like to call it, the Plus de Paramount. Well, thank you very much, sir. That is a... A very elegant intro. For Thank you. A, a I do try to there. bring the class and the culture to the range of idiocy. That well, is good. Us. Somebody has to, because I forgot mine at home in my other pants. What is your um, and another thing, sir? My and another thing is uh, one of the best titles you're going to see uh, this year: "Knife Meditations After an Attempted Murder" by Salman Rushdie. I was going to say, was that written by Uncle Howdy? Yeah. Well, <laughs> Bye. <laughs> So, uh, of course, Salman Rushdie, uh, the author, uh, of, uh, I'm pretty sure he's won a Pulitzer, mm. uh, but a very accomplished author of over 20 books at this point, uh, some mostly fiction, but also some nonfiction mm-hmm. and collections, uh, and most infamously was uh, under a fatwa, uh, a death threat, yeah. essentially a death order by the Ayatollah Khomeini back in the 80s for his book, The Satanic Verses, Mm -hmm. and lived many, many, many years uh, under essentially 24-7 security uh, when he was living in the UK. And as as time went on, he he kind of, when he moved to the US, he kind of gave that up and was just sort of like, I I need to live my life, continued writing, continued making appearances, all of those things. And, And even though there, I think there have been some plots against him that were foiled by his security and through other things, um, the, for the, most of the last 30 years, he, or the last at least 15 ish years, he's kind of just lived his life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and now he's, he's not a young man. He's in his seventies at this point. And he was, uh, in 2022, he was giving a, a talk in upstate New York and, a guy ran at him from the audience and and stabbed him, I believe, fifteen ish times. Jesus. Yeah. Um, he he lost. Uh, he had nerve damage in one of his arms. He was uh, chest wounds, uh, liver damaged, uh, cost him one of his eyes. Um, and the the weird thing about this being, it's so far removed from the original 
you know, death order, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and the fact that this person was not like well steeped in him, had only read a couple pages out of the satanic verses, had only seen videos, uh, like YouTube videos and, and stuff about him. And this book is really kind of this way of him trying to kind of come to grips with this. Like, how did this happen like 30 some years after, actually, no, almost 40 years after this original, like, oh my gosh, people are trying to kill me and I'm going to have to go into hiding. And I believe when, when the guy is running towards him with a knife, like Rushdie's first thoughts, he says is, oh, so it's you. Mm. Like almost this kind of fatalistic acceptance and calm in his, in his inner, innermost, which is weird to say, yeah. but it kind of goes through like the events of that day, his recovery, all of that. And it really gets interesting when he has this conversation with the a he doesn't refer to he doesn't give the name of his attempted assassin he just calls him the a Mm. um believing that really he doesn't deserve any kind of fame out of this um and almost kind of like looks down upon him in a way like you didn't even know me like i'm not even going to give you the respect for you know trying to i'm glad that i didn't get taken out by you because you're you know obviously an amateur which is one of the things one of his doctors told him that you're very lucky as he's like laying in bed in intensive care. And he's like, how do you mean lucky? He's like, you're lucky. This guy had no idea how to kill somebody with a knife. You know, he had like 26 seconds alone with you. He, he should have killed you almost like law of averages would say the number of times he stabbed you, but this guy did not know what he was doing. And it kind of goes into this part where he has a conversation like this imagined conversation with him and this guy trying to figure out like why, um, now I will say, if you're not a fan of Salman Rushdie in terms of like his writing style, yeah, it might be a little difficult because he writes like he writes, and uh, it's yeah. a bit of an acquired taste. If you're, he he is a bit unusual, but the demand spins a hell of a yarn. I mean, he he knows how to tell a story, and if you can kind of get in in sync with his idiosyncrasies as a writer, it's a it's a very interesting read. Um, hmm. I actually lent it to somebody and they were reading and they were like halfway through and they were kind of pissed off because like, I just don't get this. And then they got to a point where it kind of hooked them and mm. like, aha, now I'm in. Um, but I thought it was, a, this is the book that I bought when I was at O'Hare and I, I had some more time on my hands than what I thought I was going to have. Is that when your plane was supposed to take off at midnight? Uh, no. Uh, well, <laughs> at one point it showed that. It gave me flashbacks to Denver because my plane did take off at like 1231 a.m. Um, no, but yes. Uh, so I, I, I managed to devour almost half Mm. of this book, just waiting around the airport and then on the flight, half to two thirds. Um, I thought it was really good. I thought it's, it's very well done right now. It's only hardcover. So if you, you don't feel like spending a ton of money, uh, check out your local library. I'm putting a link to it in the, in the, uh, in the show notes. Cause Hey, I mean, Salmon probably could probably use a couple bucks considering everything he's been through. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's a very interesting book and it's not at all like kind of maudlin. It's, it is actually fairly uplifting and, and has a sense of humor, which is, uh, hmm. probably one of the reasons Salmon has made it yeah. <laughs> through all of this. Cause you need yeah. a sense of humor when you're dealing with a lot of the stuff that he's had to deal with. Okay. No uh, so yeah, check that out. Knife meditations on an attempted murder. Oh, very nice. And ladies and gentlemen, that about brings our traveling EDC roadshow to a grinding halt. No, we, really. We're, we're just going to pack up and head on to the next town and try and grip some people over there. Sort of like AEW. hey Anyways, uh, if you'd like to become a member of the Free Range EDC congregation, if you'd like to uh, become a part of our listenership, we would do so appreciate that. You can find us at freerangeedc.com. You can find all of our episodes there. You can subscribe right there through the Podbean app. Get all of our audio podcasts that way. Uh, you can also download them one by one if that's your thing and your pleasure. You go right ahead. Go on with your bad self. We're also on Apple Podcasts. We're on Spotify. We are on Pandora. We are on Amazon. All of those places. Search Free Range EDC. You will find us. Uh, if you're more into the video side of things, uh, we do have these episodes in full glorious. Uh, I mean, I guess HD, I think. Uh, it's not like 4K. Cause good good Lord, I'm in HD? Oh, yeah. God. Well, we're not 4K. Nobody needs that. No, nobody nobody needs, that. needs to see us in 4K. Even no. our even our wives are like, can we bring this down to like 7, 720? Can I get 8-bit? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> good God. Uh. Looked much better with the lamps off. Um, <laughs> 
Maybe that's just me. Actually, it is just me. Um, <laughs> but if you want to find us in full living color, you can find us on the YouTubes. We are at Free Range EDC there. We're also on the social medias. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Free Range EDC. If you have any thoughts, comments, uh, suggestions for shows are always helpful. Um, offers of outright bribery. We're also not above that. Uh, or below it or beside it uh, we're right there we're ready for him uh, you can send all of those to Tim at freerangeedc.com and he will get back to you forthwith if not sooner uh, and now ladies and gentlemen it is time for me to stop blabbing time for me to stop flapping my gums and turn this show over momentarily uh, to uh, the man who is well let's face it the much less idiotic side of this show uh, the man they call Tim but not before I ask him the second most important question in all of human history. The first, of course, being what is hip? The second being, oh, wow. That was kind of cool. I didn't know we got balloons. Oh, that's interesting. All right, Tim's just amusing himself over there. I am. I'm uh, but not before you. I ask him, what the hell did we learn this episode? Uh, we have learned the following, my friend. Uh, we have learned apparently if you put up the peace sign and have uh, the latest version of Mac OS, you get balloons that pop up out of nowhere. Uh, we what have learned. Even this one. Well, we have learned that, uh, especially from CM Punk, that there's multiple meanings to holding up the two fingers, especially if you're in the uh, English Isles, uh, where this is a different sort of thing. Anyways. Uh, man they called Tim uh, has hit a milestone with his electric scooter and is not being shamed for uh, for doing it. You know, people I think are jealous as I ride by in this 90 degree weather with uh, hardly breaking a sweat. Shut up, Wesley. Uh, we have also learned that AEW uh, struggling to mount something around 5,000 fans showing up at their next event here in Chicago. Right now we're at about uh, maybe 3,000. It will make you humble. And you know what, folks, uh, over there, try to invest a little bit in the character. Try to invest in the story. Get people compelled to want to watch what you have, as opposed to all of this, you know, hot shotting and, and, you know, sort of hardcore violence that you think is going to bring people in to watch. It's just, I don't know, it's just not what you I love how you say that, and yet you were also talking about the I Quit matches and Magnum TA and, like, blunt objects and people well it was because it was raw unfiltered violence and you know they're just throwing themselves through through tables like it's going out of style it's like come on guys let's let's do do this with some purpose you know let's have a purpose behind it as opposed to just you know lying off whatever object is in front of you all right oh i will begrudgingly grant you a point for that thank oh i appreciate that thank you very much uh, Man They Call Tim is uh, bullish on a remake of an 80s cult classic called Enemy Mine. Uh, Uncle Todd is a bit skeptical. And uh, we, we, will see, we will see who is right uh, between the two of us whenever that movie comes out. Probably will come out before the BSG reboot airs. But then again, everything is coming out before that reboot airs. Yeah, well, soon you're on to something there. Uh, we also uh, have learned that uh, apparently the creative geniuses at Star Wars uh, decided that a new beginning is about as compelling a title for the next movie as anything they could come up with. And so, ladies and gentlemen, buckle up because we're going to get a new beginning. You are worse than Hulk Hogan. Uh, and uh, we have also learned uh, the WWE is on a roll, baby. I mean, these events are just... It's, yeah. it's just such a pleasure to watch these these uh, these events and, and to see the talent showcased and and just have a quality product out there. And uh, you know what? They are drawing way more than 3,000 fans. Let me tell you. Yeah. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing what will happen this Friday on SmackDown and in two weeks for Money in the Bank, which is going to be a very interesting event. So do check it out if you are a fan of the wrestling. Yes, once again, Sulu on point. Uh, well, as we like to wrap things up here, uh, well, actually, there was one other thing I wanted to call out. Oh, and it, finally, we didn't learn this, but just had to say it again. Congratulations to the world champion, the real world champion, yeah. Boston Celtics, ladies and gentlemen, closing it out in oh, style in Boston, uh, as only they can do. On uh, 617. Was that? Same date they won their last championship. That's right, on 617. Also, the 16. area code of Boston. Bingo. Bingo. Can Who's we get a Sulu? Can we get a Sulu? Uh, ooh, uh, 
There we go. Thank you Don't very much. Don't you snap your fingers at me, sir? I, I'm Don't not snapping at you. I was just—I was waiting for it to kick on. You know, it's like ba-bam. Okay, uh, I feel like you're kind of giving me like those TV like. No, okay, no. go on three. Go on two. Like, don't. I, you're not going to die. I'm not your. I will say, monkey. my boys and I have have we we have this well this is the whole thing they have this running joke as we watch you know a lot of the the old peanuts uh, you know shows, and there's this one I forget if it was. Um, Oh, I think it's a Thanksgiving special, Thanksgiving Day special. And Snoopy goes to get uh, Woodstock, and he stands outside of Woodstock's birdhouse and he just clicks clicks his fingers. And so we, we always do that once in a while to each other as just kind of a joke, you know, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So sorry about that, but, you know, there it is. Uh, with all that being said and uh, sharing a little bit of, you know, the family foibles, uh, be safe, be healthy, be kind, be good to one another. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. The range is closed for now. See ya. Oh my. I think you've had about enough. Well, I th- I think you're wrong, you increasingly attractive looking woman. You know, you're you're really pretty. Oh, stop. No, I'm I'm serious. You could you could be in magazines. You you could. You can, and, and not just like jugs or or creamsicle. Call me. She won't call. Oh, here's a pleasant sight. Cirrhosis the Wonder Dog. I'm I'm not drunk. All right. I just have a speech impediment <coughs> and a stomach virus and an inner ear infection. You give me a little uh, cult of personality. I don't feel like you've earned it. <laughs> Come on. I, I just. I... Why can't that just be the outro? It's such a great song. Because we can't afford it. We don't have WWE money. Well, I don't. Right think now I'm, I'm hiding from WWE, from CM Punk, <laughs> Living Color, their record label. So you literally are the spy in the money in the bank. <laughs> I am. <laughs> This isn't just fashion. This is a this is a disguise. <laughs> I'm Guy Incognito. Leave me alone. <laughs> I, I don't normally wear glasses. This is my Clark Kent thing. <laughs> I don't really have a beard either. This is all fake. <laughs> I actually can't see now. <laughs> Where am I? Oh, well, nonetheless, why don't you give us a little COP? Come on. COP? Cult of personality. Uh... No. Make him humble. All right, fine. <sighs> there we go. We're happy now. Thank you very much. Just make your little Chicago heart happy. Range is closed. See ya. You already, you already did the outro. Don't, yeah, don't get me with the outro. music on. It makes it that much cooler. Indeed. Now get the hell out of here!